So uh, Joe Biden has rejected a meeting with Democrats who are concerned over what's happening on the border. At the same time, we've got news that CBP apprehended an actual terrorist uh, suspect and released him. And now we've got uh, information that ICE has arrested the individual, but it's kind of insane that that could even happen. How is it happening? Well, we've got a viral video where it appears it's being reported. The federal government has deployed a backloader to lift up razor wire to allow illegal immigrants to flood in through the southern border. And it's just insult to injury. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. Plus, we've got a bunch of other stories. It's Friday. We're chilling. We're just going to jump into it. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to one of our members, FoxGloveAndAssociates.com. This is a member of TimCast. And on Fridays, we shout out our members. If you want these awesome leather products, beautifully made, look at this expedition gear. We've got these nice little bags, pouches. Look at this. This guy is very dapper. Head over to Fox Glove and Associates. Check out their products and support businesses that agree with and support your values. That's what it's all about. So uh, shout out to Fox Gloves and Associates. Actually, I think I got to put the link in the description. I'll get that in there in a second. But uh, shout out to our members. Every Friday, we uh, will we just shout out uh, uh we get one of the members and we say like, here's their website because you guys support us. We support you. So uh, don't forget to also head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. Become a member to support our work directly if you like what we do. There's no members only on Censored Show tonight, but those are typically Monday through Thursday. You don't want to miss it. You can call in and talk to us and our guests, but it's Friday. So we're going to be chilling tonight talking about, uh, you know, just all sorts of stuff. So smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about all of this and a whole lot more is Dave DeCamp. Tim, thanks for having me. My name is Dave DeCamp. I'm the news editor of Antiwar.com. That's where you can find all my writing. I also host the daily podcast called Antiwar News with Dave DeCamp. It's basically a 25-minute uh, rundown of all the top foreign policy stories of the day from our anti-war, non-interventionist perspective. Uh, I got a YouTube channel. It's called Antiwar News. Go over there and subscribe. And uh, yeah, that's all my work. And uh, end all aid to Israel. All right on. Figured I'd throw, throw that in there. Throw it in there. Fair <laughs> enough. I am uh, Phil Labonte, a uh, very failed singer of All That Remains, anti-communist and uh, counter-revolutionary. I'm Ian Crossland. Hello, everyone. And I want to give a special shout out to Gamer Maids, the newest show on the Timcast Network. I popped in and played some uh, party animals, Animal Party. I think it's called Animal Party earlier with uh, Chris, Sarah, and Charles. It was high high impact, high energy. Go check it out, Gamer Maids, on YouTube and give it a subscribe. Okay, hold on. Gamer, you know. G A M E R and maids, as in people who clean your house. That's house-y. what I said, gamer maids. Right. Yeah, game. I just wanted to spell it for people who are wondering what the URL might be. Gamer maids. Gamer maids. Gamer maids. Check it out. Uh, I sure will check out gamer maids. You're gonna love it. Yeah, You're gonna ga- love it more gamer than maids. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I'm Surge.com guys. I just to gotta say, it. like, you know, branding is supposed to be memorable and easy to convey. And just how this got approved, it's entirely. I went to chat favorite. and I was like, "Where are the mermaids?" <laughs> this is this and is an adult show, show, so I, all right, this is not an adult show. This is a family show, so I don't want to talk about what I'm thinking with that. that well, that it's so fun. Title. Serge is here. Are we going to jump into the news then? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> all right. Here's here's the story, but it's not the story. The story is this: Biden declines meeting with Dem mayors demanding action on border crisis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get it. Biden doesn't care. Let me give you the actual story. Here's a video. Texas installed a border fence to keep illegal migrants out. The federal government came in and lifted it to allow hundreds of illegal immigrants to pour in. They say it's not a crisis, it's an invasion. Can I get this uh, video? There you go. I I am, I am. This is like. This is crazy. It's a When did this happen? Let me turn that down. So this is just, first, let me just, let me just say. What the? This is clearly a video that appears to be Eagle Pass. I'm not entirely sh- sure we, we we are not we don't have the exact location or whatever confirmed, but you clearly have CBP trucks there and a backloader lifting up the razor wire, allowing this is hundreds of people. What in the actual hell? Like, That's how crazy, is this, right? It is mind blowing that the federal government is lifting up, breaking the law, lifting like not only do they not enforce the law, but they're breaking the law, aiding and abetting people that are breaking the law. I just this wanna, is mind blowing. I just want to stress this once again. And you know, we'll definitely tie in aid to Israel with it all too. The federal government hates you. They are taking yeah. your money and your savings. They are spending it on money to blow up kids mm-hmm. and they're spe- spending it to facilitate criminal activities in this country. When okay, I just what would you call it if members of your own of, of individuals in your own government are giving resources and material aid to people who are not citizens in order for those people to break the laws of your country. Yeah, I think that's treason. 
It might be treason, but they're not. We're not at war with these people, so maybe not. But once again, to bundle all, bundle all of it up together, just to make it, we'll make it anti-war too. <laughs> yeah, we we they're not taking care of us. Mm -hmm. If you're on the left, ask yourself why you don't have health care. Okay. If you're on the right, ask why it is your savings is your your buying power continually goes down. It doesn't matter who you are or what you want. We can all agree the first step is. These people need to be stopped. We this need to get, get them out of government. We need to. We need. We need law enforcement to stop people who are committing crimes. This is like okay, treason. And I don't have the whole definition of the word treason, but it's the crime of attacking a state authority to which one owes allegiance. The federal government owes its allegiance to the state of Texas. It owes its allegiance to every state in the union. And if it's violating Texas law to incite criminals, uh, that's treasonous, in my opinion. What, that, what, it's just what, a sentence what, of it. I don't know. Do, do we know anything more about this? Like this, th we, when this, this happened or who so exactly this has been ongoing. these people are? This, this has been ongoing. There was actually the bigger story was that CBP was snipping the razor wire. Yeah, I remember that. And this is a component of that. Okay. So I'm assuming this video is probably recent considering this whole Eagle Pass thing has has been going on in the past several weeks. Mm. But And then is there ever any explanation? Like, Because I, I remember seeing the snipping. H have they ever said anything yeah, about that? Yeah, they, they, they claim that they're legally obligated to allow people into the country to apply for asylum or something like that. Wow. But here's the issue. If they're here, mm -hmm. allowing them... The, the argument is once they cross the middle of the river, now that they're in America, they can't be deported. And I'm just like... Yeah, I don't buy it because I think it was Texas that put the buoy uh, barrier in the water and they came and said, you got to get that out now. It's like, well, hold on. When you put it in the water, you say, nope, it has to go. When you put it on land, you say, oh, well, they're already here. Mm. Have we, is this confirmed that this is actually, this is exactly what we think it is? Because I've I seen mean, a lot of fake videos these days. Fair point. But I mean, this is, this is the CBP truck. Okay, so this is... Uh, Auden B. Cabello, citizen journalist, document the document a migrant journey, and he says Eagle Pass, Texas, Texas state versus federal battle continues this time with forklifts. This is November second. La last week, the federal government used a forklift to raise wire and let 300 migrants in. So I don't believe it's a forklift. It's a, I believe it's a backloader. I could be wrong. Mm. I remember I saw a video recently of people like putting cardboard and stuff under the barbed wire, crawling, and then they actually made them turn around and go back. Wow. But that again, that was just kind of a random video on Twitter. There's so. another. There's, there's it, another video where Border Patrol opens the gate at the bollard fencing and lets people in, and they're just like, and I'm, yeah. I'm just like, what? <laughs> this is why they got so mad when Trump said build a wall. They before before Trump said we're gonna go ham on the border, these people were just coming across, and what was happening is really interesting. They weren't reporting apprehensions because there weren't any. So when they say there were only 50,000 apprehensions, immigration was low. No, it was probably 550,000 illegal crossings and only 50,000 actually apprehended. When Donald Trump started apprehending, apprehensions skyrocketed and they said, see, it's getting worse under Trump. Now we can see what's going on. You're right. They're not being apprehended. They're being welcomed in. And we do know the Biden administration was trafficking children. I want to stress this statement of fact, the Biden administration statement of absolute fact trafficked migrant children have a nice day they're helping blow up children in gaza right now too <laughs> <laughs> that's fair and they're also blowing up children in many other countries yeah that's right. <laughs> let's let's we i'm not biased we can't be biased about one yeah i mean uh yemen secret mm -hmm. war in yemen i mean that's been ongoing for a really long time but i guess uh who is just saying that the, the crisis has only just ended Probably because the U.S. is shifting all of its resources to oh, in, in uh, Yemen. Yeah. Well, there's been a ceasefire between the Houthis, who control most of North Yemen, and the Saudis, who the U.S. was backing in that war, which is a very brutal war. There's been a ceasefire that held since April 2022 relatively well. There hasn't been any airstrikes. There's been fighting at the border. But now you have the Houthis firing missiles at Israel, and things could get, you know, it puts the Saudis in a Dave spot. Uh -huh. I, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> we should not be funding it. You're right. We should not be involved we in this stuff. We shouldn't be, but we are. I know. That's the thing. That's why we so, do need to care. No, Because but, no, to right, the but, Houthis, because you might not care, not many people are aware, but if you read Houthi media, every attack, every bombing, every shelling is not just the Saudis doing it. They call it U.S.-Saudi yep. aggression. So, uh, but I'll clarify. I'm kind of being a dick. I, of yeah. course, care about war. I don't, want, I don't want it to happen, but I think the U.S. makes it worse. You're right. And, and then they're spending my money to make it worse. And we had this, con we had an excellent, amazing conversation this morning with uh, Stephen Marsh on the culture war. And uh, we were basically just like the, the what, what Stephen said something like the U.S., if you're going to go up against the U.S. military, you're in trouble. And I'm like, why? They lose every war. 
but they win the engagements. That's a horrifying thing to say. The U.S. can actually blow you up successfully, but they can't maintain mm. control. They it just falls apart. They don't have like war goals. I haven't had seen like a legitimate war goal from the United States government. They just want to keep the wars going. Since like World War II. Mm -hmm. I mean, there hasn't been a war, legal war in the United States since World War II. I have, none of them have declared Vietnam. I don't know what the purpose of that war was. They never really... If that, that was conflict, that? Vietnam, was it to get oil? They yeah. never really say no, to no. stop uh, communism. Uh, they said it was containment. Uh, yeah. so vague. It, was to contain, it was to contain communism because con they were they were considered it the domino theory, which was as countries fell to communism, more countries would fall but to that, communism. But that's like a never-ending well, thing, so that's not really a war goal. Well, it's yeah. ended, kind of. It was, it, was, it, it was a proxy war with, with the Soviets. Mm -hmm. and I the, think they were trying Chinese. to get Malaysian oil, and they just haven't never no, wanted to tell No, no, no. Well, they won't say that out loud. Ian. It was a lot of Malaysian oil. They tried to get the TPP. Was World War One, World War Two, and the Cold War were all basically the same thing. I like agree. obviously it's one the very right. So the so Vietnam is a component of the U.S. was at war with the Soviets, but we were all scared if we engage in direct conflict, nuclear weapons will fly. So we did these. We're we're in with the war in Vietnam, and it, it was really Soviet mm -hmm. and communist Chinese interests. Well, you see what they're doing in Ukraine. They they use the same justification. The claim is that if Putin isn't stopped in Ukraine, he's going to roll into Eastern Europe. But it's just complete nonsense. That, yeah, nonsense There's doesn't even come. You got to you do the narrator meme. He would not. Yeah. He would not. But you know John Mearsheimer? He's the international relations professor, the realist guy. Uh, his lectures, you know, really popular on YouTube. He talks. He was always warning for years and years that the U.S. and the West was going to provoke a war in Ukraine. He always says that before 2014, the coup in Kiev and the civil war in the Donbass and Russia annexing Crimea, he said before that, they never said Putin was, you know, trying to go into Europe. That was never a talking point. Then all of a sudden he became this guy who wanted to reinstate the Russian empire and, you know, roll into Poland. But it's just a nonsense yep. talking point. Yeah. Putin, I think of um, three or four weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, was like, the collective West has lost its mind or the West has lost its collective mind. It was just a hilarious statement. <laughs> he's just looking at it like, what in the hell he's, is he doing? He's right. I don't think he's a good guy. But he's right. I'm. I, I, it's so weird. Like, oh, geez. dude, we, uh, how we, do we strip this apart? The, the 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 bifurcation in American politics is is just so insane. The uh, the the there's no unification on on what this country should be doing. There are people who are holding on to the last vestiges of the American constitutional republic. There's a lot of them. But then I think the average run-of-the-mill person doesn't know or care. And then the left is actually actively seeking to subvert. I think what we're seeing with the... Uh, we talked about this this morning again. Uh, the, you know, Stephen mentioned that the United States was born of rebels. And that rebel mentality exists within our documents. Our documents were written by rebels. And we maintain that even to the Civil War. It all makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then Phil brought up exactly what the government is doing. And I said they're trying to stamp out the rebel spirit. Which is a component of why they're like, get as many non-rebellious people to come into the United States, and that will start to erode our ideals. That's part of the thing, one of the things that I'm concerned about with, uh, not just with CBDCs, like central bank digital currencies, but also with the idea of um, basic minimum, uh, basic living. Uni universal basic income. Yeah, UBI. UBI. Um, when people are, are on the government payroll, the, and everyone is on the government payroll that really is going to make people completely subservient now there's still people that are like i don't need the government i don't want to deal with the government all i want to do is live my life in a way that is as independent as possible if you have a cbdc definitely if you have some kind of ubi there's going to be so many people that are just completely and totally dependent on the government more so than now now most people in urban areas most people in cities are, are on some level dependent on the government even if it's dependent on the government to make sure that they can get out of their driveway if it snows or you know to make sure that they have water and 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 sewage plumbing and stuff like that um but if you have people that are getting a ubi everything is going to be dependent on the government everything but you all of their income all of, that means that you're dependent on the government to eat but it, realistically the moment a ubi goes into effect the economy spirals out of control and within a month there's no economy at all i i strongly no agree one's eating. yeah i just saw that uh we what do we print a trillion dollars in the last three months a trillion yeah it's crazy i think it took 250 years to get to the first trillion and what what was it uh 
Eighty percent is just specifically for Zelensky himself personally. Just, <laughs> just going. Bought in him a big mansion to, and a big boat. Feed his cat. And, yeah. Feed his cat. Yeah, sure. Biden's asking for a hundred and five billion dollars to fund the war in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, to give military aid to Taiwan so they could work on provoking another war in Southeast Asia. Which and, and there is some for border security that, to entice the Republicans, but right, it's just an insane amount of money. One hundred and five billion dollars. But I love this. Biden's like. We need money for Ukraine and, and, and Israel and Taiwan and the border yeah, and yeah, the border. Yeah. And the Republicans are like, border, border. Can I go to <laughs> my constituents say and say bus? Omnibus. <laughs> I'm looking at the U.S. Taiwan's, national debt clock. Oh, we're gonna say about Taiwan. I was going to say Taiwan's the crazy thing because I don't know how the U.S. maintains a conflict with a with mm -hmm. an island 90 miles off the coast of mainland China. Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> I don't I, know what you I've, do, man. I've heard rumors that there are uh, that the United States has. Uh, special forces there. Yeah, in, we have a few hundred. Yeah. They yep. recently sent a few hundred troops to Taiwan. It's really the highest troop level since the U.S. and China normalized relations because part of that deal was for the U.S. to pull its troops out and its mutual defense treaty with Taiwan and eventually stop selling them weapons. But the way they made that commitment was so vague that they'll tell you they can interpret it in 12 different ways. But a uh, big part of it was pulling the troops out. And recently, the U.S. sent about one to 200 troops, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're China, you know, it's very provocative to China. And uh, you mentioned uh, well, sustaining uh, a war. Go, yeah, go real ahead. quick, make a point. Imagine if China stationed 100 troops in Cuba. Yeah. China has has actual police forces inside the United <laughs> States. That's a good point. What, I mean, like actual, pol like they're not policing um, regular Americans, but they're policing Chinese Americans. If, What's the story with that? Because I've heard there about are that. Actual, it seemed, like, there are, I, I think them calling it police stations is a pretty... Uh, like dramatic way it's, to describe there are, it. it's a, it's a, it's it's Chinese law enforcement operating uh -huh. out of the United States with offices to go to Chinese citizens living in the United States and arrest them for crimes against from, China. From what I understand, that's not what it is. I, again, this is something I don't really know about. But FBI I think said thought it was okay. I'm not a big fan of the, the FBI. FBI says so. a lot of things. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from what I understand, they have these kind of like uh, offices where they that are you know. On, on paper, you know, they, they say that they're there to help Chinese uh, Americans like with certain documents and stuff. And then they might be going after dissidents through those offices, yeah. which a lot of countries do. I mean, India might have killed a Sikh in Canada. You know, if that was China that killed a Uyghur in Canada, we would be talking about that every day. Yeah. But India kind of, you know, the U.S. is looking at India as this new partner in containing I, China. This I, is from New York, know, New York I, Post I, I, says that they've opened four police stations Chinese in North America. Three of them are in Toronto. One's in New York City. Mm -hmm. But you, I, I know they do. What, is, what does that mean, a, a police lot, station? The, to, to target Chinese Americans mm -hmm. for, for it's, infractions. Who knows? So maybe one but thing I, on paper and another but I, thing. But I want to stress this. I think it's fair to say that there's definitely a a very warped perspective on what China is like from for Americans. Yeah. And I think uh, we, we often get people saying like, get on, you know, uh, Lao Wai or Serpent Sa to come on and talk about China. You go to a Chinese city and you're going to go to pizza and you're going to have a slice of pizza like these things exist. Mm -hmm. There, There's competing interest and power at play. And there's no saints. There's no saints. and There's yeah. no saviors. I get the I've vibe. That, I've been to Shanghai. It was. Uh, did you have the hot? Awesome. Did you stuff get the stuffed crust with the hot dog in it? No. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. You go to China, and this is what concerns me. You go to pizza. I think it's pizza, and they will stuff make a make they they will stuff your crust with anything, including I, hot dogs. I get the wow. vibe that they're it's way more. Sounds kind of good. Uh, they're way more <laughs> allied and aligned with the United States than like the the, uh, the Iranians. Like the Chinese are severely oligarchic businessmen they don't want conflict or war destruction they want to improve you, improve you, improve and they're willing to buy, they want to buy us out mm -hmm. if anything that you are correct the chinese try to cut deals with american politicians to gain power they want to buy yeah. land they want to use soft power to expand whereas iran very different and i'm yeah. using iran as an example but the people that have been heavily radicalized in the middle east from all these bombings and mm -hmm. things well are like, the people that have been ra heavily radicalized in the middle east are radicalized for multiple different reasons the chinese like like Tim said, it's, it's all soft power, but they still want to be able to influence and they want to be, you know, they're using soft power, but it is to have the United States have policies that benefit China, whether they be indirectly or directly benefiting China, you know? Yeah. But um, but China, I mean, China, the really scary thing about Taiwan, so you mentioned sustaining a war right off China's coast. If you look at the think tanks that have been putting out these war games and about what a battle would be like, the first battle over Taiwan, like the first few weeks, and they never consider nuclear escalation. So this is the really scary part about China is that our Pentagon, our military leaders, you hear them say they're openly planning for a direct war with China. They're saying they're trying yep. to deter a war, but if it happens, they're going to take them head on. They have nukes. But anyway, with the war games, they again, they don't take into account nuclear escalation. But besides that, 
In the first few weeks, a naval battle over Taiwan, thousands and thousands of American sailors will be killed. Scott Horton recently just interviewed Lyle Goldstein. He worked at the Naval War College for 20 years. He speaks Chinese. He's an expert on this. He was saying he thinks tens of thousands of American American sailors would be killed in the first few weeks. Well, there, there was a, we talked about this, I think the other day, that the, the China does a war game and in every single scenario, a US carrier gets sunk. Yeah, if you almost have immediately. boats on the surface. Our war games. Yeah. <laughs> it's really the same result. It's cause we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do like a, like a war game, like a D&D style mm. war game. That'd be fun. That'd be we really should, we, cool. Oh, we talked about doing this. We should do two. We, we should do World War III and, and Civil War and do like a two hour long D&D session style thing. Yeah, there was a- That does a, sound fun. I, yeah. These boats. Yeah, we should bring uh, you and Scott and you guys can be, we'll be like, no, guys. No, you'll be everybody the neocons. get along, man. You no, know, you know, you're you're gonna role play as the neocons. <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds fun. I it? think you know them well enough, and you're gonna be like, war. I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. Scott's gonna be like, I'm John Bolton. <laughs> There's like a World War Three RPG, like 2020 Nikki, or Nikki something, Bolton. 2030. I don't know. It, it, they had it. I used to play it in the 90s, or we had the book. But they, they see boats. Boats are like so vulnerable to hypersonic yeah. missiles now, especially close boats that are close to the Chinese land. Like they're sitting targets. And that's hey. what China's been preparing for. Is a war right there? Someone you know, just like, sent, someone just sent me a. a um, an email or just tweeted tweeted at me. There's an injunction. Uh, the state of Texas got an injunction on the federal government for when? what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, it says the date on it is one second. Uh, filed ten twenty seven twenty three. So that this this they said was from last week. It's possible that this video is from before. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, this is probably what caused the injunction. Caused them to get right. the to to seek the injunction. Wait, so, so apparently. That's- to the state of Texas? The state of Texas got an injunction on the federal government to get them to stop basically knocking down the borders yeah, so that way crazy. illegal immigrants can come into the country. <laughs> Maybe not treason, but they're definitely attacking state authority by going it's into not Texas that. They're and They're aiding them up. and abetting people who are, who are not citizens who are committing crimes against our nation. Yeah, because technically the feds are supposed to take care of the border, right? Like not the state of Texas yep. because it's an international border. So the federal government has jurisdiction. And they're totally abdicating their their authority. Their, not, their, not only ad, ad, uh, what do you say? Abdicating. abdicating it, but also violating it. Well, yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. they're not doing their job. Is and they're making it worse too. It's not that they're just not there. It's that they're in there cutting the barbed wires and letting people in. Yeah, it's crazy. So my apologies. I pulled up the U.S. national debt clock a little while ago. If you haven't been to usdebtclock.org, pull it up in a different tab. We're printing a hundred thousand dollars every three seconds of debt. Hundred thousand dollars every three seconds. It's probably going to be a million dollars every thirty seconds. Two million dollars a minute. Probably going to be a quintillion dollars in our lifetime. Mm. I love how Thomas Massey wears the pin. The, yeah, his, it actively calculates yeah, the national debt. He just gave one debt. to Ron Paul. It made me very happy. Um, I love so, that guy, Thomas Massey. Yeah, but people people was, don't understand what this means because they're like, "What does that mean?" I don't I don't know anything about that. Like, I have my money. It means that right now you want to buy a house, you're not going to be able to. It means that your milk that you buy today is going to cost twice as much tomorrow. That's, That's if nothing means. changes, if we're on this, stay on this track forever. We can alter our, our gross domestic production capacity by pivoting to hydrogen fuel. I actually talked with James wow. Tour today. Look at this. Right. Currents, okay, so the current U.S. Uh, money supply is $20.6 trillion. U.S. Uh, treasury dollars is $1.5 trillion, And the currency and credit derivatives is $634 trillion. Wait, no, no, no. Is that? Yeah, trillion dollars. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> $600 trillion? Uh, yeah, a trillion. Well, when you hear numbers like that, it's just like, what it, you know, it's like, what does that even mean? <laughs> the <laughs> only, <laughs> the only time that anyone has ever used those numbers outside of the national debt is in like physics. <laughs> when you're talking about the numbers of like particles in the universe, you know, it's like, it, it takes that kind of like that, something that massive. Mm-hmm. Otherwise these n- numbers are completely and totally f- impractical. The human mind can't even comprehend it. And it's the rate of change that's also where mm-hmm. it becomes highly impractical. Holy, you guys ready for this? Yeah. The U.S. federal debt to GDP ratio was 124.43%. Wow. In 1980, it was 34. Remember remember 1980? I wasn't mm-hmm. alive. I remember we all vaguely. know about the uh, Jimmy Carter era. And John Lennon. John Lennon died yes. in December of 1980. My mother what died What did you say it was in well, 1980? The, the uh, 34.7. Oh, okay. And that, this, is, this is, I believe 80 was Carter, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, or was it, that that's when he was he was getting out? Yeah, Reagan was elected in in eighty, right, or seventy nine, and then was put in office in the eighty or in eighty or something like that. Or it's eighty eighty one, I think. Maybe yeah. And you know, I can't verify that this website's actually legit either. I never have been able to verify that. It, but the debt, debt clock. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this, yeah, this, this is legit. all public data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah, the, I remember it was a big deal because one day it put like Jesus Christ is Lord, 
on the on the front page and you had to like exit out to see and people Oof. people were like wow like conservatives were all like whoa holy crap because this is like a big website mm -hmm. something like that happened it was recently i think look at this the interest on the debt 676 billion dollars that's not even oh, that much man. is that a lot of money i thought it was the gonna be interest way on more the debt. than that the interest on the debt is going up that's i've this always is, considered no i think this is specifically for um the interest on the debt is for medicare social security and defense wow but the, the issue is that's that's not the debt that's the interest on top it's going up we, we're not paying that down as ian often brings up if the interest keeps going up you can't pay back more interest by taking another loan to pay back you get more interest yep we need to <laughs> increase the value of our dollar is what we need to do we need worldwide. a gold, gold standard yeah I mean, or I, i'm big into hydrogen fuel and because if we can start producing things that are value or and graphene because if mm -hmm. we can start producing things that we can sell around the world graphene's like sixty thousand dollars a ton and they are just churning it out at Rice University or, right now. You know what's what is that stuff that like blue crab blood or whatever you know what I'm talking about? Blue like, crude. No, is that what they call it? Horse it's the, it's the horseshoe crab horseshoe blood, like crab the most blood? expensive material in the world or something. Where I'm from I'm from Long Island, and we just had the, every once in a while some random like horseshoe crab genocide would happen or something, <laughs> and they'd just be all over the beach. And I always hear that it's worth their it's like worth money their blood, and I'm like, man, I should have been collecting their blood when I was a kid. Those are like the blue <laughs> blue horseshoe crabs or whatever, and they like hook them all up to tubes and extract blood slowly. And yeah. it's like yeah, I don't know crazy. what the deal is, but yeah, I've, seen, I've seen that. It's, oh, it's antibacterial. It's valued in the medical industry. Hmm. But we need like when you talk about a dollar, like I'm a libertarian, so you're always, we're always talking about the gold standard. But you know, we could have a different commodity based dollar there are different things that can back the dollar hey we can go to 2027 we can go to the future based on all these projections where we'll be oh give it to me oh my god i love this it's four years from now four years from now the average family is gonna have a hundred thousand dollars in their savings that is really bad well that is not good it says today that the average family has eleven thousand. Yep, and it says it's going to be ten x in four years. And if the uh, the debt to GDP ratio goes from one twenty four hundred twenty four percent to one fifty percent, that means the buying the, just a, a general correlation is not perfect, but that ten x increase in how much money you have correlates with like a 12, 12 uh, times decrease in your buying power. Spend your dollars, get rid of them. Buy even like I know that like there's there's people that that sounds like financial advice, Phil. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm not well, giving you any financial sense. advice. I, mean, kind of. I like to spend dollars and there get things that are valuable. <laughs> I, I know that, that, you know, whether it be Bitcoin or gold or silver or ammo or Property. whatever. Land is great. You know, buy, I think that, you know, I'm going to be buying things that are going to retain value or go up in value. I'm probably not going to be hanging on to very much cash. I like to invest in machines that I can use to increase my income, my profitability, things like that. A really good camera, a really good microphone if you use it. I mean, look, I'm not. Assets per citizen, per citizen, 1.2 million. I ain't telling you wow. what to do, what? but electronics don't hold their value. Yeah, but it's you use it in the short term to increase productivity sure, essentially i've turned into like a civil war nerd since i moved to virginia because there's like a million battlefields where i live and there's signs everywhere you know it's notice really them? cool like yeah. you'll, you'll you'll go to a dock for like to launch a fishing boat mm -hmm. and there's like a sign be like this is where this general yeah. killed this general and you're like, i oh, live wow. near petersburg and it was like the uh, almost a years long siege around the city so there's battles everywhere but it's got me kind of collecting like old antiques and that's actually a really good investment is not like really old antiques they just uh, like they, like a like a charizard. They really go up in value. Or magic yeah, cards. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Or a Mewtwo. I used to have so many. The crazy thing is, I think I had probably like five first edition Charizards when I was a kid, and they were like worth a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what happened to them. They're all gone. But now they're worth like ten to twenty thousand yeah. dollars. Have you checked your? Did attic? Beanie Babies ever get? I have not. An the, I lost all my old magic cards. That was brutal know. one day on a train. I I was we we're on a train and I was like I fell asleep and then oh. they're like oh we're, we're at our stop get up and I get up and jump off the train and I go. I turned back and the door closed and I'm oh, like, snap. all of my cards gone. That and that was pro that's probably a hundred grand worth of magic cards gone. Now, yeah. They're really back worth then, that much now? Well, now yeah. 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 But, but because the cards back then were not that not that valuable, but that we're, we're talking 25, 24 years. Now they're all extremely rare and out of print and mm. more valuable. I wonder what an Alpha Black Lotus is. What? $1.2 million for an Alpha Black Lotus? Was it like rated 10? Yeah, is nine point five. Yeah. yeah, it's the, the it's most the, valuable yeah. magic card. One point two million. That thing was like sixty six. Yeah, but you're, you're probably looking at like a special auction years ago because the, maybe uh, a, a rated eight is one hundred and forty grand. Okay, that's crazy. 
Wow. One million dollars for a freaking piece of cardboard. It was seven hundred when I was a kid, and we were like, "Wow, seven hundred dollars! That's crazy, man!" Wow. But who knows? It's going to be worth money. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's the thing. Do you remember the Beanie Babies? Everybody was like, yeah. "Oh, these are going to be yeah. worth something one day," but I don't think they ever were. <laughs> nope. That was that was a tulip thing. That was a Dutch tulip fiasco. Mm -hmm. But Whatever Phil, I think a cool thing for you to like spend money on and collect. You could get antique like firearms from like the 1800s. Yeah, and they look awesome and you can mount them on your My wall friend. and they just grow in value oh wow that's an actual union civil war rifled musket yeah that's awesome i have a yeah. breech loader uh i forget, I forget the that's name of I, it that's uh, what i need breech loader breech loading rifle from the civil war yeah, i have so. a pin fire revolver uh which is kind of a rare cap? type um pin fire like it had a little pin that stuck out of it and the hammer would hit the pin and that's what would fire the shell oh, wow, wow yeah they didn't really they weren't around for long but uh cavalry officers had them on the union and confederate side so it's pretty cool it's like i got i bought it for like 800 bucks a few years they, ago and it's just they used uh you know the longer you hold on to it the more valuable i, I think it is. i think the revolvers back then were uh the, the, the more ubiquitous was the percussion cap and mm. that's so like little metal primer goes in the back of you know each chamber and then it hits the primer, which ignites the the musket ball or whatever, or whatever they were using. Yeah, the bullet at the time. I wish and I could we've, give actually, a... we've actually got some actual Civil War bullets because uh, we have a Civil War bayonet somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah, we found it on the property. Yeah, and it's all wow. rusted and you know, and we're just like, oh whatever. They're 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 all over the place. Yeah, it's super cool. I've yeah. been metal detected on my property because there's a battle. My my, one of my... I'm, I'm I'm wondering what relics people will find from the next Civil War. So they're gonna find you know <laughs> magic an cards. iPhone iPhone 15 and. Uh, yeah. My uh, my buddy watch. back in in New Hampshire, he he does a lot of metal detecting, and he's trying to get into uh, off limit places because uh, you know New England's been around a long time, so people yeah. have done a lot of hunting and stuff. So he's trying to find places where he's not allowed that he can sneak into. I think I'm, I won't blow him up. <laughs> I, I'm kind of like, yeah, if we sit around and and just kind of complain for the next six months it could be the end of the world but if we really pioneer new tech like hydrogen tech and really push it really push it we could probably come out of this on top it depends so if what we're facing right now is actually a legitimate threat of world war three the population decrease from war and from the fact that people don't have kids means what you're hoping for is less likely to occur Techn technological expansion typically requires population expansion like the the how many people does it take to make one monitor screen it's it probably like 500 different specialties to make one computer monitor but yeah. because of the international economy and how everything operates someone gets cobalt here and someone gets you know quartz here and someone mines them the oil or, or drills for the oil over here and then they all go on these different marketplaces i think a really good example is probably just like pod thai or something some like ridiculous dish that has a spice from Asia and a, a vegetable from Mexico. And you're like, this this unnatural demonic food would never exist were it not for our big oil tankers, you know, our big cargo ships yeah. around mm -hmm. the oceans to bring all these ingredients together. That's true. If the population declines too much, you lose specialties. And then you're gonna have a guy who's gonna be like, look, man, we need someone who can extract hydrogen, but we don't have that anymore. So I can work on that, but then we don't have a guy who handles the plastics. Yeah. We don't have a guy who handles the the the, the electronics. Wait, Ian, you're worried about like the world World War Three bringing the world to an end, or is there something else you're worried about? Is it World War that's got you nervous? Yeah, yeah, because you know, for what I do, I basically read the new. You know, all day, every day, I sort through like hundreds of news articles, read about this, uh, you know, war in Ukraine, tensions with China, and all that. And I don't like to be hyperbolic in my show and stuff, but I always say like, if we wake up tomorrow and Russia bombed a NATO base in Poland and we're actually at war with Russia, or if a Chinese ship and an American ship shot at each other in the South China Sea and then a bunch of, it escalated and all of a sudden we're at war with China, you know, don't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised because right. at this, this state of the world that we're in right now, what they're just pushing everybody all over the planet. It's really, uh, this they, you know, it is very scary. And again, I don't try to be over hyperbolic, but what they're doing, they're leading us down a path of global war, the likes of which you know we've never seen, especially with new technology. And I, 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 I always, mean, I always want to stress too, because especially when we had, uh, you know, I'll shout it again, Culture War Podcast, youtubecom slash Timcast. Uh, Stephen Marsh and I were talking before the show started because he was, I showed him the Civil War rifle, and he was like, "What was the first, the first battle?" And I was like, uh, "Bull Run, Manassas." And he was like, "Right, right." And they didn't even think it, was, it wasn't even a battle; it was like a street fight, like nobody knew what was going on. And I'm like, "Yes." 
what we consider to be the first battle. I mean, obviously Fort Sumter is the start of it, but that wasn't even a battle. It was like uh, only one guy died and it was an accident. I don't think anybody died. One guy. And it, it was, was an one, accident? It was one death. It was accidental. It was like, uh, I can't remember exactly what happened. But uh, then you had the, bat the first battle of Bull Run and no one thought the fight was actually going to happen. And at the time when it did happen, nobody called it the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Nobody called it the war in the States. It was not a war at all. Now they, we look back and say it was. Both sides thought it would be over so quick. So it's possible that in 100 years, they say World War III started mm -hmm. uh, December of 2022. Yeah. It's absolutely. possible they say it started with the, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. The I, U.S. responded. I tend to think of it as 9-11, personally. The and U.S. That, was that just is, stomping is, on everyone's neck for the first 18 years of it. Yeah, but bro, mm -hmm. the U.S. has been doing that for a lot longer than... But 9-11 changed, like, lockdown, police state crap, mm -hmm. you know, Patriot Act. People were getting, you know, take your shoes off at the airport kind of crap, looking over your shoulder, afraid of Muslims, like, all this dumb... I'll tell you, so just an anecdote about when I went to China. I remember getting in, or I was getting on the plane to fly, I forget where we were flying next. But I was all nervous going through their security. I was like, I'm going to have to take my shoes off. It's China. They're going to really go crazy and pat me down. And I started like taking my belt off and they're just like, come on, come on through. And they just like hit me with the wand. And I was like, oh, wow. And then when we got back into the U.S., my wife bought like some hand cream in Australia and they put it in like a special bag. And they were like, you can't, you know, they like <laughs> shook her down and like ripped apart all her stuff and said she couldn't bring it in. Or if she wanted to, she had to like mail it to her. It was crazy. And I'm like, this is just the the remnants of 9-11 of, of what they did to us after that. It hasn't I, gone away. I mean, I don't know if it's the remnants of 9-11. The thing that we're experiencing is not actually about stopping terrorism yeah it's the it's the fact that once you start a government program they never mm -hmm. go away it's yep. the infrastructure for the tsa that was designed for you know it designed initially to stop terrorism never stopped a, a thing it's, it's an addiction yeah so what happens is the u.s government says we're going to spend 100 million dollars on war they invest in all these companies the companies build up a big employee base they hire a bunch of people next year comes around and that company goes to Congress and says, are you, are you going to give us that same deal again? And go, well, I don't think we need it. There's no war. And they go, listen, we employ 500 people yep. in your district. And if we don't have this contract, we're firing them. Mm. And we're going to tell them it's because of you. No, 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 no. You, you got my vote. You got my vote. Yeah. Yep. So what we got to do is make hit music. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, I'm talking like Marvin Gaye. I've been really... We need to make babies and we need to inspire people to have sex yeah, we gotta make and have children. <laughs> and that's music. That's like... Because if we have kids, it's not enough. You need to... You need to mass produce love and we need to make hydrogen fuel and graphene to get out of this steel hellhole that we're in and start making lightweight superconductor conductors locally really fast and cheaply. I... I you know, like I'm, I'm going to... bone. I got to stop right here. Ian is completely correct on graphene because steel was such a large component of our industry, of our jobs, of our economy. Uh, the Steelers, Pittsburgh, how much steel is still being made in the U.S.? I do not believe very much. But uh, either way, if we had an industrial revolution on par with, uh, uh, you know, what it was in the past and we bring back a bunch of jobs, you could have manufacturing plants pop up all over the place. It could revitalize uh, dying towns. It could create new cities and it's it's going to have to be, you know, we we, we, we often do joke about graphene and Ian's uh, uh, fervor, but the reality is it is a bold move to reconfigure an economy towards building a material that can be uh, used to expand and create a bunch of new products. Uh, my favorite example, a lot of the stuff we use plastics, for instance, and I think paper towels, a bunch of stuff were invented uh, for space. So, like, a lot of the things we use are invented by... Space race. Air, air, yeah, the space race. And then it, it's like, oh, this is convenient. People might want to use it. We can't just sit here and be like, let's just keep doing the same thing we've always done. We need to be like, guys, we should be... We're doing... We have the CHIPS Act. We're, we're, we're ma making silicon yeah. chips in, in Arizona now, or we're starting to. That's great. That's a great idea. We should have a... some In some way, it's going to require, I, I believe, most of the private sector, it's, which, mean, which means a cultural shift where we get someone who goes, I want to bring together a bunch of financial institutions and invest $100 billion in manufacturing plants for graphene. We're going to employ 5 million people in the United States, and we're going to be exporting a, 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 a building material and superconductor, which is going to be in, in major demand around the world. That will massively increase 
uh, benefit the U.S. economy. Yeah, the Department of Defense is working with uh, scientists at Rice University to pump this stuff out. Graphene, I think for every $4.50 of graphene, you get a kilogram of hydrogen fuel. And so they're actually getting, they're making money to produce. Before it was like it cost a dollar, it cost $3 to make a kilogram of hydrogen. Now you're getting $4.50 to produce a kilogram of hydrogen. It's right in front of us. So I interviewed James Tour today, the leading chemist, one of the leading chemists on earth that's producing this stuff. It's an hour of us talking about it. He gets really, we, we scratch the surface and do highly, highly uh, influential explanations. Uh, go to my YouTube channel and check it out. It's the first video you'll see. It's James Tour. This guy's phenomenal. We're right on the precipice, man. Now we just got to hold it together and inspire people. I'm I'm kind of at a loss at what it is that you think graphene is going to do. You can put it in um, that cement. In, in, uh, there's a lot of things. And you no, watch no, the video but, but for if you want to hear what more. What does steel do? Well, steel is used for all kinds of stuff. It, like it reinforces concrete. You it, could, and, and graphene does that. You can and put it in concrete. It makes it lighter and more three times more durable. Oh. And it's uh, so we, we so we, we use lithium ion batteries for our phones. Mm -hmm. They're actually starting to create uh, uh, a graphene polymer uh, lith or lithium graphene batteries. Uh, graphene layer in the battery creates a, a uh, um, what's the word? A lattice. Uh, a unilateral charge. Okay. So it charges from every point all at once, which mm. charges the battery much more quickly. So graphene it conducts electricity. It's well? a superconductor. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, so whereas a cell phone would take fifty minutes to charge in the past, it'll now take five. We, uh, we now have the, we, we actually bought a bunch of these a year ago, portable batteries. When you plug your phone in, it'll charge your phone from zero to full in 10 minutes. Be, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It, it can hold a full cell phone charge after only 10 or so minutes. Your phone, whether or not you have the graphene polymer batteries or, 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 or the graph, uh, what is it? Graphene, lithium. I don't, I don't know. I forgot what it's called. But they're, they're, they're putting them in batteries. They think that this technology in, in electric car battery, batteries means you'll pull your car up to the pump at the gas station plug in the supercharger and you'll literally watch the charge go up like a gas tank. Wow. They yeah. used to, they were like, how do we make this stuff graphene for the last 20 years? How do we make it chemical vapor deposition? They're trying to deposit carbon dioxide onto copper and get it. And you, you get these strips. They figured out what's called flash jewel graphene production. You put, you hit it with electrical current, any carbon on earth, you can get all these different plastics. They used to have to recycle them and pe pull them apart because different plastics recycle differently. Any carbon, all the plastic together, fe human feces, plants matter, any carbon, <laughs> and you hit it with electricity and you turn it into all graphene. Right. And then this guy, I'm actually going to be uh, uh, interviewing the inventor, Dewey Long. So, so, but, but let's bring it back to the, the, the debt, this country. My point is... I will, I will go along with Ian on graphene for one reason. We need a manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. We need the American people working on raw materials that we can use to build infrastructure. Steel for a long time, not just steel. There's a lot of stuff we did in the United States. We should drill, baby, drill. We should invade Canada. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we should invade. I'm in Alaska. But Canada, yes, too. I'm, I mean, I'm only half kidding. But uh, no, we should invade and occupy Alaska. We should not waste our... Here, here's what I think. When we go and blow up people overseas... What we are doing is we are creating a global economy as hollow as a fiat dollar. Mm. We, 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 we provide Absolutely. you nothing other than don't screw with us. And these other countries say your offers are hollow. We only need protection from you. If the U.S. said, OK, we are going to bolster our manufacturing, develop new technologies, create a very strong, robust middle class that works in development of new technology and, and new infrastructure and new raw, uh, raw materials and metamaterials. We occupy Alaska using our own land to search, uh, rare earth minerals, for instance, stop doing dealings with China, we would then become that shining city on the hill. And other other nations would say, we got to be like them. We got to do business with them. Yeah. And if we're not, don't have a global empire. <laughs> you know, we should be able to do those things without having this empire. I, and I actually you mentioned the CHIPS Act. So the problem with the CHIPS Act is that it's basically corporate subsidies, $50 billion, yeah. which is adding to the debt. The, you know, I think the answer isn't subsidizing this industry, um, which is something, you know, China does. I think we should, uh, you know, resort to more capitalism and deregulate and, you know, give people tax incentives and to start factories. And, the, the, you know, they're actually getting a lot of the Taiwanese companies to build factories. The things here. that you're going to have to do to, to get to get the to get people to start businesses like that is I don't know. I don't know the first thing about making chips or anything, mm -hmm. but I mean, the between unions minimum wages and the the amount of things that you have to deregulate and pull back on it's just astronomical so i whereas i understand and agree with your 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 point i don't think that it's that bad to have the government try to do things to tax breaks or whatever to incentivize companies to start it mm -hmm. but it, they're giving them billions of dollars 
Check out uh, you know, un- fifty billion. That's a lot I'd, of money. I'd rather them give it to to a company in the U.S. than give it to Israel to drop bombs. They're giving it to a lot. A lot of it's going to Taiwanese companies to bring them here, which I, I'm not sure the you know the percentages, but I know some of it. At because least. the reason, the big reason why we have you know companies that are doing things overseas and stuff is because of labor laws and because of regulations yeah. here. So if you uh, can environmental pull, regulations, yeah. The if you can pull, roll those back, then you could get. Then there's an incentive for companies to start. But as long as the federal government has the, the type of legislation that or regulation that that disincentivizes companies from starting, I mean, but, it's got to start it somehow. And I, I want to I correct you on one thing. Not really correct, but I want to counter. Um, I want a strong, robust American empire <laughs> that is achieved by being really cool, producing great products, mm-hmm. being a great trade partner, not interfering in other countries, business and politics, but being so good at everything we do that they want to learn from us. Mm. We want we want other countries to say, let us know what you need. That new thing you guys are working on, your economy is really great. We all love America. We all want to be like America. Your movies are awesome. We want to win through cultural means, yes. not bombing children. Yeah, yeah. culture and science. And, Those are my two know, favorites. We, the yes. U.S. empire uses force in a lot of different ways. You know, if countries like elect a government that the U.S. doesn't like, they start putting economic sanctions on them, you know, purposely to destroy their economy. Yes, yes. And, but let, let, let's be fair. Uh-huh. The U.S. also removes that government by force and then puts in a sock puppet government. Sometimes, sometimes. Right. But other times they just sanction the hell out of them. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's part of the reason why, you know, the U.S. on the global stage right now, if you're like a developing country and you see the way the U.S. operates, especially now. All for the past year and a half, you had Blinken, Biden talking about, you know, lecturing Russia on the war in Ukraine, talking about this rules-based order. And now we see them fully backing Israel as they're just blowing up kids and everybody can see it for themselves. But it's just like the hypocrisy is is very obvious to other countries. But the the, the funny thing about Russia and Ukraine is Russia is having a territorial territorial dispute with a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. The United States flew to the other side of the planet to invade Iraq and Afghanistan. It's true. And why was Iraq invaded? Well, I guess it was WMDs, but 9-11 was kind of the pretext. Why was Afghanistan invaded? Well, because the Taliban were, uh, were harboring uh, Osama bin Laden. So we, we had to go and build a nation there. And then Russia invades a neighboring country over a border dispute. And we're like, whoa, whoa, hey there, wait a minute. Condoleezza Rice, like a few days after, sorry if I got a little worked up there, Ian. You looked a little startled. I'm so into this. <laughs> Condoleezza Rice, a few days after Russia invaded, was on TV and was like, I forget exactly what she said, but Condoleezza Rice of the George W. Bush administration said, a, a country cannot invade another sovereign nation or something like that. <laughs> and did you see, do you remember George W. Bush's little uh, Freudian slip or whatever it was? He was giving a speech and he was like, one man's decision to invade uh, Iraq, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I that mean, was amazing. Ukraine. And then he kind of laughed and he was like, yeah, Iraq too. That was a moment, man. I watched that video like a hundred times. Because this it's country just, is full of shit. It's definitely somewhere in his brain. But yeah, the, the founding fathers, I think, if they saw what was going on, they'd be like, they'd be stacking we, bodies. They'd be no, like, no, 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 hold why on. Where are your businessmen in it's, politics? It's like your them. grandfather being like, "Son, I gifted you this really nice car, and you totaled mm-hmm. it." You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah no, the found. I, I want to stress this point too. The founding fathers notoriously just petitioned over and over again, and it. I. I, I think it's fair to say it was not the Americans who started the Revolutionary War. It was the British imposing uh, 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 tyranny. Like, if we go straight to Lexington and Concord, they said, hand over your guns or else. The Americans, the founding fathers were like, I'm going to write a strongly worded letter to the king. And the king's like, screw off. Well, I'll write another letter to the king. And it was a year and a month after uh, uh, Lexington, Lexington and Concord, they signed the Declaration of Independence. Mm-hmm. So it's not like the Americans were like, it's time to stack bodies. They were like, please, please, we're just trying to have some representation here. Uh, fair enough, but you know, Washington did cross the Delaware and kill everybody in their sleep. So, <laughs> but what that I'm, is true what I, too. But, but that's in the war. My, yeah. my point yeah, is, was later on. We, the, America may be rebels, but when we started, we were not the dudes who decided to go and kill other people. We were the dudes who 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 honorably and reasonably said, listen, what you're doing is not working and we are telling you now this has to change. And if you don't listen to us, the change will come either way. And then it was the crown that was like, we're going to come and put you down. And then we said, we didn't start it. You did. They came to they came to Lexington Concord and they said, we are going to come at you. It was not Americans who went to England to 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 fight. 
it was the crown sending regulars to, yep. to the colonies saying, we are going to impose our will from overseas on you 100%. and brought the guns and then demanded of, of the Americans. I think that the, 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 the founders of this country were calm, rational, reasonable people who understood war was bad. They did not want foreign entanglements. I love reading about the, the Barbary Wars and Thomas Jefferson and like, He's like, we don't want to be involved in any of this stuff. Why are you attacking us? What are the and Barbary Wars? This is cool. Pirates, North Africa, and uh, Jefferson and other founding fathers, Adams. They're all basically just saying like, look, man, we're just selling stuff. We have no problem with any of you. Why don't you leave us alone? And they're like, screw you. We do what we want. They said to the, it was, they said to the, to the, in England, they said to the, the United States representative, they said the Quran gives us the, the approval and authorization to kill you and take your stuff because you are infidels and so uh, thomas jefferson created the united states marine corps and that was the res the response was send in the marines so the marines have been fighting for the country for as long as there has been a country this is the barbary war a series of two wars fought by the united states sweden and the king of sicily against the barbary states tunis algiers and tripoli yeah and so Morocco. you made a point the I, uh i oh sorry the 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 United States Marine Corps, the Marine Corps hymn, there's the line that says, uh, to the shores of Tripoli. Yep. That's what it's referencing. Yep. From, the, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, Tripoli, the Marine Corps fought for the United States. That's a good song. Yeah, it's all right. I but like it. I, I remember you made the point before we started recording that like you favor, you know, the U.S. could have a strong Navy and kind of p police the waters a yeah. bit and work with their trading partners to counter piracy. And I think that is a completely legitimate, uh, you know, foreign policy to have just to have a navy and fight piracy with your trading partners but we're just so far from that we're in you know meddling in every country mm -hmm. around the world you know we're not anything close to that a lot of people like to point to the barbary wars as an example of how all the founding fathers actually were not you know non-interventionists but they were responding to yeah. their property you know being attacked yeah they were, so they it were is completely protecting different protecting americans yeah um yeah and so this is completely different analogy from what you're talking about about how the british brought the war here my, my point was the founding father's attitude was like hey let's just mind our own business we're going to do our thing here you leave us alone and now the mentality of the united states is we offer nothing but we take mm -hmm. yeah so what i what i imagine the united states is doing with the with the current empire it's it's like a, a piece of bubble gum it's being blown up and blown up and blown up but we know what happens eventually it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and then, then it pops there is nothing within this bubble. It is hollow. The United States cannot exist by simply going out with guns and saying, we get to do this. We can invade Iraq and Afghanistan, but Russia better not invade anybody else. To be fair, Russia shouldn't invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. has no leg, to, no more leg to stand on. What the U.S. should do, the U.S. should have some type of whatever you want to call it, empire in the sense that we are so good. Our laws are just. Our people are fat and happy. I mean, that figuratively. Our economy is great, and it's done through production, it's done through trade, it's done through technological development, and then what happens? Nobody's, people People will be jealous because we're rich, that always happens, but we're not blowing up kids, we're not amoral crackpots, our money isn't being siphoned away from us, our economy is expanding, our families are happy, our kids are happy, our roads are taken care of, our infrastructure is taken care of, and other countries are like, we need to be like them. And Look can. how well they're doing. You want to spread democracy or whatever it is you call it? That's how you do it. You show up in a country with guns and then kill the elderly and then try to raise a new generation and you get Afghanistan. Doesn't work. Mm. I love it. I think that the United States, China, and Russia have a duty to protect the planet, especially the Arctic. It, it's so important. We, and and one, we're right on the brink one of One thing back to the British, like bringing the war mm. to America. You know, when we talk about Ukraine, I mean, for so long, mm. Putin and the Russians were telling, you know, the U.S., like, you know, stop doing what you're doing. Stop it. And, you know, in the weeks and months leading up to the invasion, you know, almost a year before they were, you know, massing troops and they, they uh, submitted these security proposals. They wanted NATO to be rolled back. They wanted a guarantee that Ukraine would never join NATO. And the U.S. just said no, basically, to their main demand of Ukraine joining NATO. A State Department official admitted this in an interview shortly after the Russian invasion. And so, you know, and I'm not, you know, justifying Russia's invasion, but it is very clear how the U.S. and the West provoked this thing. And, you know, that's the thing. That's on Russia's border. We're, you know, we can't even, we try to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. Could you imagine if 
Russia was funding a war in Canada, you know, like there was a civil war there and then we intervened and Russia started sending them missiles and intelligence. <laughs> there was just a report in the Washington Post that said the CIA in 2015 started building up Ukraine's intelligence services, the SBU and the GUR, which is their, their military intelligence, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. And uh, they were basically saying that because of that support, Ukraine's able to kill people inside Russia. They pointed to the car bombing of Daria Dugina. Do you guys know who oh, she yeah, is? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, the daughter of Alexander Dugin that yep, the Ukrainian SBU did. They basically pointed to that, saying they were able, they're able to do this remember because the of the CIA. And the statue that exploded. Do we know what that was about? Do you remember that? There was a, a, a internet personality in Russia. Someone oh, yeah. brought in a small yes, bust of his head. St. Petersburg it exploded. Cafe. Yeah. yeah, that's That holy. was them, too. That, that, that report yep. said it was them. And, you know, it, it closed with a very ominous quote from like a former CIA official basically saying, like, what have we created here? What if they start killing people in third countries? You know, what if, you know, like the blowback from this Ukraine war could be very serious? It's going to be like Afghanistan. It is it is going to be uh, like like the Mujahideen. It is it is Ukraine is now uh, what was it? The Republicans pass a funding bill for Israel, but not Ukraine. They're mm. saying it's going to be dead in the Senate. Joe Biden, here, let me, let me pull the story up. Post-millennial, Biden admin announces additional $425 million military package to Ukraine. So we have weaponized and armed Ukraine, but Ukraine is losing. The appetite for funding this is on the decline, and we've got an election coming up. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens to the v extreme, I'm not saying extremists, I'm saying like very fervent national uh, militia groups in Ukraine who are funded and trained by U.S. forces when the U.S. pulls out and says you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You talk about the fear of bombings in third countries, uh, uh, other non, you know, outside of Russia and stuff, 100%. And then what happens? Give it 20 years, and you've got trained armed groups in Ukraine who hate the United States for some reason or another, and you get uh, Al Qaeda all over again. Yeah, in no, some you, form or another. There's, you know, because you you hear the Russians talk about the Nazis in Ukraine, but there is a real neo-Nazi element in Ukraine. Um, it, you know, it's not huge, but it is very influential, and there are certain groups. So there was like these raids going on in Russia that were done by this group called the Russian Volunteer Corps. They were Russians, Russian people that were fighting. You know, went over to Ukraine in 2014 to fight for them, and they're like openly neo-Nazi. Wow. And they had American armored vehicles. So you had a group of neo-Nazis basically invading Russia. And I think this was Belgorod. They, they tried this a few times. They didn't get much done. But you have a group, a band of Nazis invading Russia with American weapons. Like, again, fathom, try to put yourself, you know, we can't even imagine something like that the, happening the, to the, the US. The Russians are actually uh, probably justifiably sensitive to Nazis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's probably fair. I mean, the they're... optics of it, of Germany sending Ukraine uh, leopard tanks with the Iron Cross on I them. Mean, like, what makes how some, could this happen? What it, makes them Nazis? Is it like racial superiority mindset or something? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't focus too much on the Nazi element, but there is like the Azov battalion that was basically a neo-Nazi militia. <laughs> Uh, during the 2014 Donbass war and the and the coup and everything that joined uh, the Ukrainian forces. And there's also, you know, the history of Bandera and the Ukrainian nationalists during Stephen the World Bandera, War II yeah. that worked with the Nazis. And there are people that wear, you know, Nazi iconography uh, on their uniforms and stuff. And it is pretty prevalent. Like, you'll, you'll notice it um, in pictures of Ukrainian soldiers with this certain Nazi icons. Um, so it is definitely an element of they're you know what they call the far right i kind of hate using the term far right these days because people probably call me far right but <laughs> it is like there's certainly that element inside ukraine i think it's worth breaking apart what nazism is exactly hitler just used that term national socialist and he made some psychotic political movement out of it but he called it national socialist but just if you're a nationalist and you're a socialist doesn't mean you're a nazi like hitler kind of means you're a nazi well <laughs> Because so there's not a lot of light between the as much as the socialists and communists don't want to admit this, there's not a lot of light between communists and Nazis, right? They they the Nazis are nationalist and they they have a lot of racism, but 
the and the communists tend to not be nationalists. They want to see a global socialism, but they're racist too a lot of the times. And you can see that in in the way that the the socialists are are behaving towards a lot of the the Jewish people that, that you see uh, a lot of the anti semitism that's going on now. So there's not a sig not a lot of difference. There are there are nuanced differences. But the real significant ideological differences are between liberalism and socialism or liberal, yeah, liberalism and socialism, which Nazism is a type of socialism because liberalism is, is based on enlightenment principles, right? So it, they, the fundamental thing about liberalism is the individual should be free to live their life and that the government is there to maybe have a social safety net maybe not but there's different there and there's different amounts of government that are acceptable but with socialist ideologies the the collective comes first so the nazis believe that the german people came first and communists believe that the workers come before anyone else but it's a it's a social uh, it's a, a collectivist versus an individual ideology so th there's there's not a whole the differences between nazis and commies is only nuance and, I always thought it, it was basically like Nazis were traditional and commies were progressive. Yeah, but they were all super authoritarian and wanted to lock you up in a cage and, and kill your family. Exactly. But the, to get back to this, uh, the four hundred twenty-five million dollars that they're announcing here. So this is uh, money that they do have left. They have they're kind of running out of money to send over there. So Biden in that one hundred five billion dollar package that he requested, it, it includes sixty one <laughs> billion dollars to keep the the Ukraine war going for another year. They want to do it so they could get through the 2024 election. And again, there was just Zelushny, the Ukrainian commander in chief, just did an interview with the economist saying it's a stalemate. There's not going to be a breakthrough, but that doesn't matter to Biden. They want to keep this thing going. They want people to, be, you know, there's still, there's been fighting. Territory hasn't changed hands much, but a lot of people are dying and that's what they want to continue funding. Um, so it's really just sick stuff. I, I mean, think this, the dying part is, is just, uh, I, th I don't think that it's what they're after. I think the money and the the yeah. and stuff is what they're after, and then the people dying. Well, that's they what don't happens. Care. Yeah, and, just, and they don't care. Yeah, they're just slimy. Well, but. if you actually see how some senators kind of pitch this now, I know this is. Uh, I know Mitt Romney was saying this recently. You know, their argument for continuing this war going is, oh, we're getting our money's worth. You know, I got mm. an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what what's the total number of uh, members of Congress? Four hundred thirty-five. Four thirty-five. All right, it's a little bit more than the four twenty-five. But uh, here's a deal. We, the American people, will give each member of Congress $1 million to not fund war. <laughs> and so you have, the, the, it's, 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 a, it's a good and a bad. We got to negotiate here. <laughs> we are going to have to spend that money, which adds to the deficit, devalues your currency. But at least it stays as currency in the United States for trade. And we aren't blowing up people or funding war in other mm -hmm. countries. Yeah, it sounds like a win. -win. So, members of Congress, if you vote against this, I say we give you all a million dollars <laughs> tax free. Tax free. Yeah. <laughs> pay pay members of Congress a million dollars, but only. Hey, wait. Here's an idea. Any year with no active war, members of Congress receive a million dollar bonus. Yeah, that sounds. Great. I'm in. Yeah, and, I mean, and 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 Senate included. Yeah. I Deal. Mean, they're never gonna get it, but. There, maybe yeah, but that you know, would incentivize the guy, them. The, no, because you got, you got a member of Congress being like, million dollar bonus, huh? Yeah, but Raytheon's going to pay me $2 million after I get out of Congress True. and go take that job and lobby for him. Well, that's another thing now. Like, the corruption is so obvious. Like, Lloyd Austin, Biden's defense secretary, he came straight off the board of Raytheon. <laughs> and he, they, he started funding this war in Ukraine that made all these weapons, Raytheon weapons in very high demand, weapons that they stopped making. Stocks started going up. Yeah, this, you know the Stinger missiles, the anti-aircraft missiles that they gave to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan? Those were basically obsolete. You know, I think they were selling some to Taiwan, uh, they, but they stopped making them a while ago, and now they're in hot demand. They're calling in like 70-year-old Raytheon engineers to start making them. But, this, but, but it is, you know, the point I made about industry so you, you, have a, you, you have a manufacturer who makes, um, he makes bullets. And let's say he makes a thousand bullets per week. Mm. The government comes, comes to them and says, we really like the quality of your ammo. Can you produce for us an additional thousand? And the guy goes, if I'm going to do that, I got to hire like five more people for like logistics and all this. And they say, well, we can pay you a premium. We'll pay you X amount. And the guy goes, wow, I'm going to, I'm it's, it's 2.2 times my revenue for, for uh, only two times the ammo. I, I got a good premium on this deal. Next month, 
He says, I've got these employees working here. Are you going to rip my contract? And they say, no. And he goes, then what do I do with these employees? So the problem is the war machine becomes an addiction mm -hmm. where it's not just about the kind of bribery of, I'm going to tell your constituents you did this. It's that, okay, look, if we lay off 100,000 people, economy is going to get hit by this. You got to keep building these things just to keep the economy going because these jobs will be lost otherwise. That's how they make the argument. That's what Blinken, right. Blinken's been saying that recently. Oh, it's good for American jobs to spend all this money on wars. I loved it when Trump said it. He said and it about, with the Saudis. Yeah. Exactly. He's like, we're going to sell them a bunch of weapons. It's mm -hmm. great for the economy. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, wow. I, I hear that they <laughs> sell, the government contracts are long term. They'll do like, I don't know how many year term contracts, but they don't do like one year contract. If you get a government contract, apparently it's very lucrative for your company. You're set. Mm -hmm. I remember a long time ago, there was a story where- uh, and You don't even have to do a good job. The, the, the mili <laughs> the, one of the armed forces, like the army or whatever said, we, are, we, are, we, are, we do not need any more tanks. And then Congress says, nope. And then mm -hmm. pass legislation That's to build more, saying we don't care what you think. Ah, slow targets. Wonderful. Hypersonic missiles. And the reason that, that they do that is because, or the reason they can do that is because they, they break up the production of them throughout multiple uh, congressional districts. So you'll have the pieces that go into tanks made throughout the whole country. So no one person can say, we're going to stop this. Because everybody's like, well, if we stop making the tanks, there's going to be job loss nationwide or in these 50 congressional districts. And the Congress people are like, no, you're not going to do anything that's going to affect our job market. So the incentive is not just from the government. It's or it's not just the government wants these things. It's the way that the government has set up intentionally set up the production of these of weapons and stuff like that. It's it's throughout the whole economy. And so. You've got you've got the incentive from multiple people in Congress to say no to vote against it if you want to. Did you want it. to add anything to that before we jump? I was just going to say I remember Matt Gates voted for you know he's been very good on the wars uh, some wars in the Middle East he introduced resolutions to leave Syria and stuff. Unfortunately, he just voted to give Israel fourteen billion dollars to fund that war. But I remember he voted for the NDAA. Oh yeah, and which he, one? And he just said well, the, I think the, it was the recent. infamous. Oh okay, a recent one. Uh, I don't remember exactly when, but I just remember he went on Twitter and he's like, "I voted for the NDAA because real it, quick National Defense Authorization." Yeah, Act. sorry. So it's the annual, basically, Pentagon spending bill that they pass every year. And Gates just said, "I voted for the NDAA because it brings jobs to you know the district that I represent in Florida, and that's that." And it's like, okay, at least he's honest about what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, at this, you know, I would hope to see him vote against it because it's just such a behemoth. But did he vote for this one? What fourteen billion package? 14 billion. Was it just that, or was it so part of an omnibus? It was fourteen point three billion dollars for military aid for Israel. The way that Johnson, the new House Speaker, and his people wrote it up was that it cuts the fourteen billion from the IRS. Right, right, right. And sends it to, which is such a I Republican mean, move. It's like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we're going to make some cuts and send it to fund a war in Gaza. I, so, Well, to be fair, it is better than just adding to the debt, but it's still not good. You I think I mean? NDAAs count as omnibus bills because they, they have you, all kinds of I, stuff. I, in them. So I, I do want to jump to this very, very big story. But the first thing I want to announce is uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg tore his ACL. Uh, he was training for an MMA fight. Damn. And uh, I just want to say shout out. Sorry to hear it, buddy. I hope you get better. ACL tears are no joke. PRP, and, uh, dude. You got yeah, this. I hope he's, he's got a picture of him in, in the hospital. No, I sincerely mean it. Not a fan of a lot of things that Facebook has done. But uh, man, ACL tear is brutal. Elon, brutal. you should reach out. Send your well wishes. Cause Elon was joking with Joe Rogan about how he's going to dominate Mark in, a, in an yeah. MMA match. And he was fun laughing and laughing. So hopefully, Elon, you'll... Yeah, your ACL is like a, a strong, strong component in your knee. And, yeah. and that this can end careers for, for pro athletes and stuff. So I, Well, Mark has access to the best medicine on earth. I'm excited to watch his recovery. He like really trains, right? Like yeah. Elon Musk probably couldn't take Yeah, him, Elon right? was like, I'm a walrus. If yeah. I lay on him, he won't be able to get up. Joe's <laughs> like, that's not how it works, dude. <laughs> He'll get put yeah. in a submission. If you get choked, like, you're done. Yep, yep. He'll tap out. Um, okay, we got a big story. This is a story from the Daily Mail about vaccines, and vaccines are on the ballot. The first thing I want to say is, ladies and gentlemen, don't take medical advice from podcasters and talk to your doctor about what's right for you. But this story is very interesting as per the sentiment held by people in this country and how it relates to, J uh, to RFK Jr. versus Trump and Biden. Check out this headline. According to the Daily Mail, a quarter of Americans say COVID-19 shots are unsafe and that they know someone who died from one. As 2024 wannabes, DeSantis and RFK Jr. take skepticism on the campaign trail. I think this number is highly questionable. That one in four Americans know someone who died. That is a, a strong, like, we, I think we'd hear in the news about that many people having died. That being said, 
I want to clarify. If there are 10 people and they all know Bill and Bill dies, and then you ask these 10 people, do you know someone who died? They'll all say yes. Oh, that's a great point. Yes. Yeah. It's it's still just and one even person. People that know them who know mm -hmm. Bill might also say yes. You know, right. a friend of my really friend. And they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah it's like, someone. oh, I know someone who died. Yeah, my friend's friend Bill. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we don't know exactly what this means. Also, I didn't get asked. So they didn't do a, a holistic it, approach. it actually does say, um, despite several attempts, Ian Crossland did not respond yeah. to a request for And I never will. Uh, so your emails, I, Ian. I want to stress, uh, YouTube, calm down. Uh, I am not talking about this because I care to talk about the efficacy or issues around vaccines. That's for you guys and your doctors or whatever. I do think it is politically important that people feel this way because there's a question of uh, we're talking with Luke Rutkowski about RFK Jr. And Luke was saying there's a good there's a good possibility that RFK could take votes from Trump because Trump was bad on vaccine mandates and lockdowns and RFK Jr. is good. And I say, yeah, but the you know, the core ideologies of RFK Jr. and Trump are so different. You, you're, I think you're going to find somebody who says, I'm willing to forgive Trump on a lot of things because he's anti-woke, he's challenging these government contracts, no new wars, etc. And RFK Jr. called Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day, and that's like a red flag for a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, that being said, let me read a little bit. They say, Americans are growing more skeptical about the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, and politicians from left and right are echoing these fears in their campaigns to win the White House. Polling this week shows that while most voters trust shots for COVID-19, MMR, and other bugs, millions more have changed their minds in recent months and no longer see them as safe. The surveys come as health chiefs warn of rampant online misinformation linking injections with death and autism, and that ivermectin, an antiparasitic drug typically used in animals, can treat COVID-19. Again, don't take medical advice from a news organization either. Despite these warnings and their implications for public health, two politicians are building vaccine skepticism into their 2024 campaign. It's DeSantis and it's uh, uh, RFK. But here's here's the image. Look at RFK's face. That's it's the most hideous, <laughs> angry. <laughs> so here's here's some questions. They, they asked, uh, is the COVID-19 vaccine safe? In August of 2022, 73% said yes and 18% said no. As of October 2023, 66% say yes and 24% say no. That's really interesting. They ask, do you know someone personally who died from side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine? 24% said yes. 69% said no. They ask, is increased vaccine use linked to kids getting autism? 10% said yes in April of 2021. As of October this year, 16% say yes. And then here's, here's a big one. If there was a major class action lawsuit against pharmaceutical companies from for, for vaccine side effects, how likely would you be to join the lawsuit? 24%, very likely. 18% somewhat likely, not very likely 22 and not likely at all 25 with 11 not sure. The plurality is not likely. And uh, they ask, is ivermectin an effective treatment? At, in September of 21, 10% said yes. As of this month, 26% said yes. And I want to stress for the 800th the time, I am just reading polls. Calm down, YouTube. Yeah, not all vaccines are the same, and it's not fair to classify them as such. The, the, the Well-tested medicine is very different than untested medicine. I like not the, having polio. The sure. And and the main point here is what is shifting the American perspective on this issue? Well, let's first find out how many people got polled here. This is an important aspect of this one, because if it's just a thousand people, then I'm I'm going to stop reading Daily Mail like that is a gross miscategorization yeah, of the, the one do? in let's, four Americans. Uh, that's a good point. Let's, uh, it could be a, it could be a, a like highly biased a poll. A thousand to fifteen hundred. I think it's uh, it's Rasmussen reports. And the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the of the University of Pennsylvania. I'm, wow, Rasmussen's usually pretty good. But Rasmussen and uh, yeah. University of Pennsylvania. If it was just Rasmussen, I'd say Rasmussen gets a lot right. You know, we'll see. The both of them together, I say, okay, that's really interesting. Again, this is not a poll about whether or not they vaccines actually cause issues. It's something is shifting the perspective of the American population. This is going to play a big role. I'm wondering, however, you know, when Luke said. Trump was bad on vaccines and lockdowns, so RFK Jr. may pull from him. Yeah, but Biden was worse. Biden and Democrats were 10 times more into lockdowns and, and, and vaccine stuff th than Trump. Yeah, but Trump was in when all the worst stuff happened, when it came to the lockdowns, at least. I, I guess he was he was the he was the first guy that we're going to shut down for. A couple yeah. Weeks. So and I think, you know, because you mentioned how RFK Jr. and Trump are very different ideologically. But I mean, so many people who vote. I mean, just this is just people I know who voted for Trump. They're not like uh ideological really they just go in and vote trump because they don't like the other person like a lot of people voted like that so if they see rfk jr 
and he's really good on this issue. And this is a big thing. Just COVID in general really affected so many people, you know. So if he's good on it, that might just be enough for people. Um, I think that that's an issue that could flip a lot I of just, Trump voters. I'm just really curious. What do you think is causing this shift in the American public's perception? Well, I mean, the corporate I, press has been insistent on vaccines. And, and, and you know, we here as good stewards of, of, of information, we don't break any of these YouTube rules. How could these people possibly hold these views? <laughs> I think that it's the fact that people mistrust authority. But, you know, yeah. trust in the in the media and trust in the government had been going down for a long time prior to COVID and COVID just uh -huh. annihilated a lot of people's trust. There's a lot of people that that are horribly embarrassed by the the way that they supported the government that they believe things that the news said and i think that that this is the 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 result of that if you have a society that generally has a declining in trust and a and honestly we, we are more cynical than we've ever been you know it's like being earnest is now looked at as something to be mocked and so believing that what the news tells you is is something that will get you mocked nowadays if you say oh yeah. i believe if you have enough followers on twitter you can say i believe anyone anything it could be anything at all and someone's gonna say you're wrong and you're dumb for believing it there is an there is this there is this impulse that people have to be the the one person that has the inside track and so people are afraid to believe things. They're afraid to admit that they believe things because they're going to get mocked. They're going to get called out. They're, they're going to be people that say, you're dumb for believing that. Didn't you know? How could you believe that? I mean, I see it all the time on, in my Twitter feed. Oh, how could you believe that? You know this and how could you not? So I think that that disincentivizes people to believe anything. They're afraid to say that they believe anything. They're afraid to say, oh, I, I think this is actually true. And they don't know where to go to get information that they feel like they that should be trusted well let me uh let me piggyback off of that it, did this article even link to the study to the poll or are they just like a poll said one well i mean they, spe they, they specified said, that they, i don't even trust it. this story that they're i think they're lying i don't even think it's <laughs> well, one they, they cited rasmussen and university but did they link to it but what do you mean like to the cross tabs yeah like show me how many people they pulled if they oh, pulled right, a thousand right, right. people and, and no, you're saying fair. that, that I mean, extrapolates I, I, to 350 um, million. I'm going to be I like, I think I'm going to have to go directly face. to rest music for that. When you say that there's like a shift here, like has people, has there really been polls asking this question before? You know, we don't really know if this reflects no, yeah. like a shift. I, 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 they, it looks like they had previous polls asking the same question. Oh, yeah, you're right. Now that um, aside, the poll, let me let me see if I can pull up the, the cross tabs. That aside, I think that rushing this the uh, COVID vaccine, the the warp speed thing, <clears throat> tweaked a lot of people. Like that was that was like. I'm afraid for my life because of COVID and I'll do anything you say mentality. And then when we saw rises in like myocarditis, that's yeah. like terrifying. Yeah. And Trump still like brags about warp speed, right? When they ask him about it, he says, uh, you know, how He'll, proud of he, he was. He literally brags about yeah. anything it's, there's that such he a big, possibly something could. I kind of wanted to ask you guys about, because I know Tim, like you're, I don't know if you consider yourself like a MAGA guy, but no. Um, I I'm know, voting for Trump. Yeah, uh, he's far from perfect, but he's the best. It just got. seems like there's a pretty big distinct like difference between the the MAGA movement and the things that Trump actually says now. Uh, but I know he represents yeah, something more so. RFK Jr. I got to say he was a big disappointment um, because you know I'm, I'm kind of a single issue type of guy, and he came out really strong on Ukraine, you know, very well. And then uh, people started calling him. Fif fi sorry, fifteen hundred uh -huh. adults. Okay. Yeah, that's this. It's just such a disingenuous title of the article. Fifteen hundred. I mean, that's what do you mean? It says poll polling. finds. Mm -hmm. Poll finds. Oh, well, it's it, fair point. You should have said one in four of fifteen hundred polled. Like that's Wait, not three hundred fifty. Polls million are people. typically like a thousand yeah, to fifteen hundred. Yeah. If you fifteen hundred is so actually you above average. Kind of consider that. Yeah, you're right. I consider that it's highly manipulative. Mm -hmm. It's it's just an absolute waste of a title. That is it is most disingenuous, misleading title. To say that one in four Americans think it when they polled fifteen hundred people. Ian, I don't think you understand how polls. I work. understand completely how they work, and they're massively manipulative. Wait, how many? Well, they are manipulative. Most people n understand that they're not oh, trying. to. they're not to... supposed to be, but the way the article phrased it, it makes it extremely manipulative. I, I, but the point that I'm making is, most people understand that if you are talking about polls, you're not talking about a poll of a hundred thousand people. Like the the uh, civics most, actually. 
What was that? Civics.com. They have polls that because they're so expansive, there's 300,000 people. Really? Polled. Yeah. It's crazy. Good on them. But still, most most polls, like they're not hitting, you know. But, th- but, but uh, this was many. a shock title to get clicks. It's Daily Mail. I mean, it's junk. Sure, but, yeah. junk, but, junk news but mag. It's a Rasmussen and, and uh, what is it? The, uh, I want to get the name right. The uh, Annenberg Public Policy Center. So oh. the way polls are done is through there's a scientific polling method where they take a wide range of individuals they whittle down their their networks there's uh bad things and huge margins of errors when, when it's done improperly but you basically try and create a cross section of america isolate it down to the key demographic areas where you notice these ideological shifts and then pull a thousand people and then figure out what the percentages are and then try and like that's it's it's normal like, and 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 you can you can argue there's a margin of error in these things, yeah. but right polls, like a three thousand no percent margin of error or something. What were you going to say, it's Dave? Like 3%. I, I felt like you were. I interrupted you on accident. Oh no, I was just wondering. It wasn't really related. I was just wondering what you guys think of RFK Jr. I mean, have I, you had him on here? No, I like. No. I like the fact that he, he canceled on us. Oh, did he? Uh, yeah. I like, I like the fact that he's counter to the narrative that the government puts out. Mm. I think that he's terrible on literally everything except for vaccines. Yeah. I would say so again with the foreign policy like he was he was very good on Ukraine and he explains it well he interviews people uh you know he had his own podcast he was interviewing people I know this guy named Ben Ablo who wrote a book called How the West Brought War to Ukraine it's like a very short book that came out right after the invasion explaining how the US provoked it so he interviewed him and he really understands the issue but when it comes to Israel people smear him you know they they called him an anti-semite and he just went all in on Israel and when this I- thing happened it's just like he says that the U.S. needs to support an Israeli sustained military campaign. I need to issue a clarification. This is the data comes from two different polls. Rasmussen and Enberg did different polls. They're just yeah. being mentioned in the same article. You got the Rasmussen was fifteen hundred. The other one, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, fifteen hundred. Uh, uh, one thousand one hundred and ten was Ras- was Rasmussen. Okay. Rasmussen was actually one of the most accurate polls in I think twenty sixteen and twenty eighteen. I think I think consistently actually. When the, when, when the polling data comes out showing how many people voted, Rasmussen almost always nails it. For the record, I really, really like accurate polling. Like if you can get 10,000 people and you get an accurate readout of what those 10,000 people think, maybe you can be like, you know, the issue is in this city, I'm, I'm, you know, if Rasmussen does five polls and then they say, here's 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 what people are saying. Fifty one percent, forty nine percent. Then the election happens and they go, yeah, it was. They were right. 51, 49. How? How about that? And they do it five times. Then they come out with another poll. I'm like, okay, I'll, 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 I'll lean towards believing them. Ian, Ian, I just want to push back a little bit on what you said. If, the, if you're dealing with a country with 330 million people, why is 10,000 acceptable and, and 15? No, I'm saying not? in a small town of 10,000 and you poll 10,000 people. Oh, okay, I like right. those kind of polls. Or even if there's like maybe 15,000 people and you pull 10,000 of them. Fair that's, you need that's, like that's 70 insane. or 80. The line's accurate. You need an. Oh, if you really, on, if you want to come out and make a statement that one in four Americans that's, believe something, that's not a you better an poll election. at least ninety percent of them. <laughs> right, Ian, you're, you're you're not asking for a poll. You're asking for an but election. It is a poll, I'm like, asking for a real poll, not these junk polls. Polls that aren't they do. the best. You know, polls are kind of the best you have when it comes to the things you're looking to find out. When it comes to like election polling, think, they're not part. They're they're better. There can be a lot of think flaws. That's lazy thinking. But they're really the only. Like thing. they're like just because that's how it's always been done. Like just deal with well, it. Kind of mentality. Well, you're saying that's just like the best. We can do. He didn't, like, say, no, he didn't say, say we shouldn't we improve. I'm it. saying it's just when it comes you, to you know, especially elections. When you like, it is kind of your best indication of where people are at is polling. And it's, and the question is, are the ha, has the polling organization been accurate in the past? And then if we look at Rasmussen and find that they typically are very accurate, you discrediting them because you don't like polling methodology makes no sense. I discredit them because they pulled. 1100 people and then they claimed to speak for 330 million the article did (laughs) yeah i think you know if you're saying that they should just poll more people i think that's a hundred percent and and most polling most polls actually say 47 people of those polled said yeah or that's what they should say not the shock the shock statement you're you're complaining about a news organization not the polling institution no i think you know (laughs) speaking of polls there was just a poll conducted by i forget the name of the place but it was about israel and gaza and it said the majority of americans support a ceasefire it said the majority of republicans do which, like, I almost didn't believe it. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of Americans do want a ceasefire, but to like, it was like eighty percent of Democrats and fifty-six percent of Republicans. 
you know, they polled like 1,500 it's people. It's the tr Trump people don't want war. Yeah, a lot of, yeah, you're right. I think a lot of the ordinary Trump people don't want war, even if it is Israel. But unfortunately, the MAGA politicians seem to uh, favor it. I think one issue, well, well I don't want to derail. No, 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 Another no. issue I have with polling is, uh, and this is a little bit off, off base, is that I feel like it is a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. If you see, if they poll people and they're like, 80% want this, then people will see that and they'll be like, yeah, me too. Like that, that can kind of that. That's guide. why the, the their political polls will often try and skew it in favor of their politician to convince people that our guy's the winner because mm. people want to vote for the winner. And like, it's so weird. If you see the polls, the election polls right now, I mean, Trump is leading the pack still by so much. So that indication, like we don't know the exact, what the exact vote would actually be, but from constant polls showing him so far ahead, it gives you an idea. I got a question for you. We've been looking at these polls. Uh, RFK entering the race as an independent. Do you think that he pulls more votes away from Trump or from Biden? I think Trump. I actually do think Trump. Uh, again, because just, you know, the Trump, the average Trump voter might not be so ideologically drawn to Trump. Uh, more of a, I know so many people have voted for Trump in 2016. It was just a vote against the establishment. Uh, same thing in 2020. Just a lot of people that didn't like Biden. I also knew a lot of people that didn't vote for him that did it because they were kind of sick of it. But I think this COVID issue, again, when it comes to Americans, issues that really affect them. I mean, this is something that really affected Americans. Uh, to me personally, I, you know, my wife's business closed down. We moved out of this city. We, you know, changed our whole life. And it's something that people are going to remember. You know, this is this was a very serious time in, in, in America. You know, it's kind of like if you think back on it, you know, I was living in Brooklyn at the time with the lockdowns and it was just looking back like it was so insane and everybody went along with it and i saw andrew cuomo and when i would go get a coffee on the tv with his nipples sticking out telling us <laughs> to stay in our houses and it was crazy and i was so angry about it angry enough that we left and you know i'm fortunate enough that i was okay you know my wife's business closing down we were fine we were able to get out move out to the country but a lot of people don't didn't have that option so you know i think he could definitely pull some trump voters that still feel that anger about what happened in 2020 yeah man now what i would love to talk about is the vaccine the covid vaccine or the series of covid vaccines i i don't want to make start going too hard on it on youtube i know that youtube has requested that we don't you know splather our opinions about it i would love to because i think this is just so many people were traumatized by this experience of the covid vaccine or the covid virus i mean and the then thing the about vaccinations you know i left new york before this happened you had to show them your vaccination papers to go into a restaurant. I mean, yeah. that is insane. That is stuff that the anti-vaxxers were saying a few decades ago that people were like, you, not even a few decades ago, not long before that, people were like, that's crazy. That'll they, never 2020, happen. they were like, they're going to start doing these passports. I was like, shut up. No, yeah. they're not. And they did. They In tried York, doing, they I tried the live. app. I they, can't imagine it. They tried doing the app and nobody would do it. Mm -hmm. They wanted a social credit score. So you know what's interesting? Get uh, So RFK Jr., Israel... So that model, what New York City did, and I think other cities did it, I think DC might have did it for a little while. You know, the vaccine passport was modeled on Israel's green pass. Israel like was very, you know, vaccine mandate and lockdowns and stuff. And I believe it was called the green pass. So kind of one of the most intrusive things that they did to us was based on Israel's model. China, on the other hand, they had their uh, lockdowns that were really insane, but they actually, they tried to implement some sort of vaccine mandate in Beijing and people were like, no, we're not doing that. And then they gave up. So it's kind of interesting just the differences uh, in the countries. Like it's not something you would really expect that you would just assume China had like a vaccine mandate, but they didn't. Like in that sense of you have to walk in and show them your card or scan something. Um, but yeah, it's based off Israel's uh, model. Wow. I was thinking the other day how funny it was. And maybe it's funny, strange, not funny, haha, that it was COVID. They were like, it's so dangerous that you have to get tested to find out if you even have it. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Really? Did One you hear? Thing I'm what, proud what? of so, is that I've never taken a COVID test, and that wasn't really like intentional, but I just never did. I took one, <laughs> and I tickled the back of my nose, and I was just sneezing and blowing all the snot out. Dude, yeah. it felt so good. Uh, <laughs> I was outside doing it. I was maybe like, I should, oh yeah, rolling maybe around. I should take one. That sounds. It cool. felt really nice. Okay, that's awful. Yeah. So now everyone knows. <laughs> but back to politics. That was a rough uh, week. I I I don't I don't see. Uh, I think RFK Jr. pulls from both Trump and Biden, but two to one Biden from Trump. Uh, Biden to you think Trump. so? Okay. Yeah, because RFK Jr. is a is a uh, he's a liberal. Yeah, his core is liberal. It's true. He's so, Kennedy. He's got the Kennedy name. Exactly. Democrat. And you know, and Ian, he's running on that. Ian's pointed out name, when he talks about his family obviously. that his family would not vote for Trump 
they would vote for Biden, they might vote for RFK. Mm. I think that's just like a really simple way of breaking down what this might be. They did vote for Biden. I don't know what they're up right. to these days. I, I should talk to them about it. I mean, Biden's mental degradation has become if, very apparent. If the poll crazy. is for Democrats, five points towards RFK, meaning your average person has a 95% chance of voting for Joe Biden, that still means 5% vote for RFK Jr., whereas the poll for Trump supporters is like one. Mm. What are your feelings on Vivek Ramaswamy? Uh, he says, uh, you know, a lot of good things, but uh, I think his foreign policy, he's pretty off base, uh, on some things with, you know, Taiwan, for instance, he, he wants to commit to defending Taiwan, but he also says things like, oh, once we get semiconductor independence, then we're not gonna, uh, you know, worry about Taiwan anymore. But he's still saying that, you know, to deter war, we should, you know, commit to war with Taiwan and also his plan to end the Ukraine war. He's like, I'm going to get Putin to sever his military alliance with China. And that's how we're going to end it. It's not really a realistic plan. You know, they don't really have a formal military alliance. They've been building one up and doing drills and stuff. Uh, but also just they're not going to go for that. I mean, trust has been destroyed between the West and Russia. You know, there's going to have to be some uh, real good faith negotiations and, you know, trying to just get something like that. Like China and Russia have really built up their trade relationship in recent years and they're very reliant on each other now. They're not just going to give that up for the U.S. That could change in eight, four or eight years. Somebody will come in and say, you know what, forget that. We're going to move, you know, move NATO into Ukraine. Forget that guarantee we gave you. We need to rebuild trust before you could do something like that. Yeah, new administration is a is a definitely a big thing. Like Putin's yeah. not a dumb guy. And he also tries to play it off of Richard Nixon going to China and shaking hands with Mao. Uh, but what Nixon uh, had the, the Sino-Soviet split to capitalize. They were already enemies, the Soviet Union and, and Communist China at that point. Um, that's not the situation right now with Putin and Xi Jinping. You know, they're they're best buddies right now. So it's a very different time. And, uh, you know, I actually spoke with uh, Chaz Freeman about this, who he was in the U.S. government in various positions, but he was actually Nixon's interpreter when he went to Mao. And he agreed that, you know, the idea that it's anything similar to like that is just is just off base. Um, so, you know, I think kind of there's other ways to argue for ending the Ukraine war, just the fact that it's not in American interest that it's every day that we continue it. It's very dangerous. We're spending all this money. We're going bankrupt. They think that should really be the argument. And we see that argument from other Republicans. Do you think it's just to declare like a white peace and cede the Eastern Donbass to Russia? Um, what I think should happen? Yeah. Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, um, you know, right now, I think really the U.S. just has to end it and make Ukraine negotiate something and, and whatever that is. And, you know, realistically... At this point, Russia is not going to give that territory up. Um, and, you know, it's it's the Donbass and Zaporozhia and Kherson. You know, we're not we shouldn't be risking nuclear war for those territories. You know, it shouldn't have gotten to this point. It didn't have to get to this point. But now that it's at this point, we need to end this thing. We need to end this thing tomorrow because, again, we could wake up and be at war with Russia again. Assassinations in Russia with, you know, CIA trained groups killing people. It's it. You know, the fact that we're at this point is really unbelievable. Well, I would love to just drill down into the philosophy of what's going on in the Middle East, in uh, Israel and Palestine. It is, however, 931. I think we're about to take some super we chats. We are going to super chats. YouTube's been giving us the business, though. The super chats aren't loading properly. Load me. But it's fine. It's fine. We'll figure it out because uh, this is what we do here. We, 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 uh, we do it. We're going to pull up these super chats, and there they are. They're back. All right. Let's go. Shaky Own says, is Stephen Marsh's next book titled Canadian Delicacies, 1001 Excuses for Eating Boot Leather? <laughs> uh, nice. That's brutal. I, I, uh, here, here's my assessment of Stephen. I think he's a good dude. Uh, the first time we had him on, it was an excellent conversation. I think he and I can see the same thing. However, he's coming from the establishment perspective and we're coming from a moderate perspective. And so this is one thing to try bringing up on the show, the Culture War podcast is that he said something like, there are more seditionists on the right than the left. I said, what's your metric for that? He goes, court cases. And then I said, okay, where are the court cases around 529? He goes, what's that? I'm like, okay, that's my point. If, you, if, if, if his argument is it is not that bad that far left extremists were throwing firebombs at the White House, set, set, set fire to a church, and they rushed Trump into an emergency bunker, and that doesn't warrant investigations and arrests, it's not insurrection, it's not sedition, well then you're coming from a very biased perspective. And I'm not asserting either. I didn't say there was more on the left or the right. I think I think it may it may be fair to say there's more on the left, but they're less extreme. 
And there are very, very few on the right, but they are very extreme. And so, uh, but, so that means his view of what's going on, when he sees, you know, something happening that leads us to civil war, his perspective is skewed by an establishment perspective, whereas I think ours is certainly skewed by an anti-establishment pers anti perspective. But as Phil pointed out with Jonathan Heights research, the right knows what the left is thinking. The left does not know what the right is thinking. So we are a more moderate, probably in many ways, right leaning uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, basically because the left doesn't come on the show. I think the people on this show are, are fairly moderate. But that means we have a more holistic view of what's going on and why. And Stephen's more biased in that regard. He thinks he's not. I think he is. And then he says we're biased, but it's actually really simple. If he's coming from a left liberal perspective, we are to the right of him because we're in the middle. And so he doesn't know what, you know, so that's what I think. But I think he's a good dude. We had, we had a lot of fun. He played poker. He's really good as well. I really at like poker. him. You guys don't have, any, yeah, you guys have leftists on here once in a while, right? But they don't come on. Well, you had Max Blumenthal. Recently. They do. Yeah, but Max is a good dude. Yeah. Like m many of he's these leftists, leftists that I like a lot. But they're, so he's, he, he, he was honest. And he was like impressively honest with his views and his mm. his his, his uh, pro Palestine bias. He said, but he's telling us the truth. He said, like it, it's it. We, I get it. I'm like you're allowed to be in favor of Palestine. You're allowed to even be in favor of Hamas. I just don't like that. So be honest about it. So I appreciate these leftists in New York cheering for Hamas. I I'm I appreciate that they're telling me they feel that yeah. way. I mean, how many of them are they, are they really cheering for Hamas in New York? Literally. So, mm, like, almost, almost every rally they're cheering for Hamas. I know that there's, again, you know, we talked about this before the show. I know people involved in these Bro, rallies and stuff. And, explicitly cheering for Hamas. Yeah, but I know there's a lot. I, I think that might that might just be being amplified because I know, again, and, a lot and, of Jewish anti-war uh, activists. Absolutely. Are and this means organizing these things, leading. These and that things. means your the people, you know, organizing things are handing microphones to people to cheer on Hamas. What, what do you think, like, when you see, like, p the p like the, the leader of Hamas talking about, like, killing all the Jews? What leader well, that's, of Hamas? That's, that's, the, the spokesman that, that was on recently but saying that's not that even they're the going to keep fighting? I mean, yeah, that's not the point because... The, the, the point I'm making is this. At almost all of these rallies in New York, like Times Square specifically, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about, like, Grand Central where it's people sitting down. Uh, you have a woman get up and say, our freedom fighters paraglided into Israel... And fired 5,000, okay, that's Hamas. And then yeah. you had one guy said, our freedom fighters kidnapped a whole bunch of hipsters. I'm sure they're doing see great. see that one, yeah. The, the, but there's so many of these. I don't think there's as many as you think. I th again, I think this is being amplified because the, there's like an internet propaganda war going on. I think that's, an, uh, look, um, I mean, you see the big marches that the, the people What is from the river to the sea the, That means that uh, from Jordan, the Jordan River uh -huh. to the Mediterranean Sea, Palestinians will have equal rights. That's what that that's where I that chant came that, from. I, I, I don't yeah, believe that one second. That is that is like defund the police doesn't really mean defund the police. It absolutely yeah. I meant mean, defund. Read the about okay, this. so hold on. I mean, hold on. this is so so from the river to the sea. You're saying mm -hmm. does not mean the abolition of the Jewish state. Uh, it could mean it to some people if they want one state that's not a Jewish state. That 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 could mean that it means different things to different people. I know the Likud founding document says basically from Jordan to the sea. You know, it will be Israeli uh, sovereign territory. So there, but there are there are Arabs in in the Knesset, right? There are Arabs that are mm -hmm. in the in the parliament in Israel. If the Palestinians had the had control over Israel and it was Palestine, there wouldn't be Jews. I mean, that's like, what I don't buy. I and I don't. I, I mean, I understand there's people that are going to say, "Oh, they wouldn't." Blah blah blah. I don't buy it for a second. And the reason I don't is because there are an if Hamas, right? If the attack on the seventh, if Hamas were like super soldiers, they would have killed everybody. But they're not. No, they're, they're not. Also, but there are enough mm -hmm. people that hate all the Jews in in the Middle East to kill all the Jews. Well, there's like 16 so, 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 million Jews on Earth. Well, let's let's slow down. Max brought this up. He said they want to return to their ancestral homeland, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does that mean? If if Israel removes the barriers of Gaza and says everyone is now free to move about the country, what happens? What do I think would happen? If uh, Israel took down all of the fencing around Gaza and said, uh -huh. everyone in Gaza, you are now free to move about the country. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what would happen. But I would, know, would, would the people that Max said want their ancestral land back try to get it back? I think some people might. Some, it's some people? It's a realistic thing. Like, I, I agree that the kind of the right of return that the people, the children of refugees in Gaza that want to go back to, you know, their homes that their parents or grandparents were kicked out of is not really a realistic thing. 
But I mean, we're talking about a peace deal essentially that that wouldn't happen. It, them just opening the fence and letting them them go. I, I'm not saying that's they need happen. to negotiate. That, you I know, get a that, real but that's peace. not the point. The point. But is, the more that this keeps going on and they keep killing children, that, but, but I mean, now you're shifting away from what I'm talking okay. about. My point is, when protesters say "From the river to the sea," mm -hmm. you are giving them the benefit of the doubt when what you're giving them makes literally no sense as to their own arguments. Mm -hmm. If their argument is a right to return to land which currently has houses and families living in it then you would argue that the, the nicest way to, to view it is that they will come enter those homes and say, we live here now too. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that absolutely will result, will, will result in violence. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, when it comes to a one-state solution, the, the, what the things that Israel's doing in the West Bank, right now they're still kicking people out of their homes, especially since things popped off on October 7th. You know, a thousand Palestinians have been kicked out of their houses by by settlers. I'm not, I'm not here. No, I know to, you're not saying that, but you're talking, I'm talking about leftists right now. If they just open it, but leftists, but we're we're I'm talking about protests in the United States. Yeah, where they're either explicitly defending Hamas because it's what we're, we're talking about. I said you've got people prote protesting in, in support. I of think Hamas. that's a very small minority. And then I said, Again, what does River to the Sea mean? Uh -huh. Because you have high school students chanting it. And if the argument is Palestinians will have equal rights, that would mean people in Gaza can freely move about the country, correct? Mm -hmm. And the right of return is explicitly they want the land back, which means you have no the, the river to, from, a, from the river to the sea in the nicest interpretation means mass violence in Israel. No, it doesn't. How do it's you get your land means. back? Are they going to go and, and file? Uh, are they gonna well, that's it? assuming that that's the deal that, OK, you guys can have your houses back. That's not going to be the deal. They're so, not just going to let people, okay, you could go now, go run, you know. So the argument would be that from just, the river to the sea just literally means they want to try and, and get to go to Tel Aviv. It means equal rights. Yeah, they want to go to the beach. That's what some kids in the West Bank always say is that they want to go see the beach. They can't go see the beach. They live under military occupation. Their entire life is under control of the Israeli military. And, you know, we talk about what happened on October 7th. Um, you know, there was an attempt at nonviolent protests in 2018 and 2019 called the Great March of Return, where they just walked to the border fence. <clears throat> and some people were throwing rocks and lighting stuff on fire, but mostly- See, Max didn't mention that. It was an unarmed protest. Of course Ma not. Max said they started shooting protesters. Yeah, of course. He didn't, he didn't mention no, that. No, but they were, were shooting protesters. Sure, but they were shooting were unarmed people. Rocks. I know. They shot, they shot Max, somebody in a wheelchair. Right. And, they and, shot women, uh, medics, very clearly medics, journalists. I, 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 they I, killed you, hundreds my, of people. My, my uh, simple thing for all of this is I literally, as it pertains to American policy, don't care about the moral arguments of war in foreign lands mm -hmm. because the argument is we can't adjudicate this for them. We are not the world police. I agree. Yeah. And so uh, whenever it devolves into like, yeah, but Israel or Gaza, I'm just like, you know what? America's not supposed You're to be right, involved. But you were just... asking those questions. But my, 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 I'm not asking the questions uh -huh. about the, what, the, what Israel is doing in the West Bank versus Palestine. I'm asking about Americans here at rallies are, are, are protesting in support of Hamas. And you said, I think it's a small group. My argument is if, if, if the argument is only a small group of people, our are government is helping if, if Israel a, blow up apartment buildings and kill children. Literally, our government's doing this. You guys are worried about you know the war on terror being turned in on the right wing. I mean, and, this and is this what has the to do war with what on terror about. looks like. What I'm saying uh, why is, why are you focusing on these college kids chanting this stuff when our not government people is in doing New York a City mass are not college kids. Right these now. are these are, okay. See, this, this, this is this is my point. This is what it devolves into. My attitude, my argument is, there are people in the United States who are advocating for extreme. Uh, 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 look, if if if, it, if a pro Palestine Our activist comes to me, and let me finish. Everybody, okay. If a pro Palestine activist comes to me and says, "From the river to the sea," and then they're like, "We will return to our land and we will have this back," I go, "Okay." And they go, "Help, help! They're killing our kids." I'll be like, "Bro, like, what do you what? Mm -hmm. There's a war going on where Hamas just killed a bunch of kids, and now Israel's killing more civilians because they're bombing things." But you came out and cheered for it. You can't come to me and cheer for the murder of civilians mm. and then be angry that Israel's killing civilians because I'm like, you guys are in a war and one side has power. It has nothing to do with me. Don't cheer for civilian death and then cry about civilian death okay, later. I, I don't agree. believe you. I agree with that. I don't think they should cheer civilian death. Again, I do think that's a small minority. And the, the problem is the same argument is made by people in support of Israel where they're like, Israel's not trying to kill civilians. They were attacked and they're retaliating, take out commanders and, and leaders. And now you're 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 highlighting these civilians. Mm -hmm. No, no. All civilian deaths are bad. Yeah. The, so here's where Israel wins the PR war. Oh, one thing I want to mention. So you had Rechtenwald on the other day and he mentioned that there was some evidence that on October 7th and the fighting that happened a few days after IDF uh, that killed, the IDF killed some Israelis. And he didn't have a citation for that. So that's actually something that Max Blumenthal covered at the Gray Zone, but he cited Israeli media. And again, this is just evidence that some of the civilians might have been killed by the Israeli military. And that's, that's I, a, so, so here's the issue I have with that. Okay. Not that he was wrong. It's that 
if he said there's a there, there's been reports it's possible when the idf came in fog of war they yeah. didn't know who was shooting who and they, there was friendly fire i'd say well that happens all the time of course he said they were they were they were bombing uh, yeah. houses and 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 shooting but, people but to come out and be like the idf was killing their own people and, and bombing houses it's just I like whoa, whoa, whoa. Said, i mean uh that's I, I just didn't get that vibe from the way rectenwald said it but maybe i'm just biased because i so uh, so here, here, here's my view. I, I am I am the United States. I don't mean like I am literally yeah. there. I mean like me here. I am a U.S. citizen, and I see the Israeli side, the Palestinian side, and I'm like, man, I, I see civilians dying. This is bad. Mm. Two things. First, uh, the left and the pro-Palestinian side has lied about too much. I'm not I'm not a historian on, on Israel Gaza. They said a hospital was bombed. Lie. They said that That's a refugee not, camp wasn't a lie. The hospital wasn't bombed. Well, it was. They said it was decimated. They said that the, they, well, the le building was level. Who said what when that, that on, report happened that night? I, a lot of people. Rashida Tlaib, A lot of people said a lot of things. Five, yeah. Was it five hundred people died mm. and a hospital was decimated? And then the whole conversation was what could have blown up a hospital? And they was like, oh, it was a parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, I think, so then, then the refugee camp. Oh, actually, it's not a refugee it, I mean, camp. They it's, are refugees, technically. Oh, right, technically, but it was actually there, a city. And there was a lot of so, civilians there, and the IDF admitted it. There's a reason why so, they. But the you're talking are, about lying. Like if we're if you're not going to trust them because they lie all the time, the, mm -hmm. the Israeli government also lies you're, you're, all the time. You are correct. And yeah. now here's the problem: as me in the United States, who's not a historian, the, the the people on the left in support of Palestine lie about these things. Mm. And then I ask the question: well, Is is Israel being honest? You just said Israel admitted to bombing a, a refugee village. So what, what Israel is winning in the PR war is they're saying, I'm sorry that this is happening. It's war. It's terrible. We did this. Yes. And I'm like, wow, they admitted it. Then Israel says, we are desperately trying not to kill civilians. And I say, OK, I hear that. I mean, then you get people on the pro-Palestine uh, pro side in New York cheering for the killing of civilians and then coming out and be like, help, help. They're killing civilians. Hamas is also saying that they didn't mean to kill civilians that, you know, so if you're going to argue that Israel Hamas they come is out, saying that they didn't mean to kill civilians that's what Israel's saying and they're slaughtering civilians right now look no, at no, what's no, happening no, but you you did say Hamas is yeah. saying that they I'm, did I'm not mean to kill to civilians what he, to civilians. what he said yeah Right, okay, I just but want to make they, sure they you, said it was in the crossfire. You said Nasrallah, what, okay. the Hezbollah guy, you know, he's not Hamas, obviously. He's I don't Hezbollah. believe Hamas. Okay, that's but, fine. But, but no, 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 because <laughs> you don't have to believe Hamas. Settler, I don't believe them either, Phil. Phil, but, settlers are not civilians. I don't believe them either. That's, that, that's, that's what they said, but, right? No, they, are, they, they admitted that <coughs> civilians were killed. No, 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 but settlers are not civilians. This is an argument made by a Yale professor to justify the attacks Hamas committed. My point is simply this. I'm not here to tell you who is right or who, who is wrong. I'm telling you the PR war is being won by Israel because Israel is... is I, I think right now they're losing. That's only on the internet. I mean, yeah, I, that, I don't think so. I mean, we had, uh, when we were talking to Stephen Marsh earlier, he said, you realize the left died this month because of what because of palestine because of because of the activists tearing down the flyers because uh or i, I believe that was the, the larger insinuation is because of what we're seeing with uh like amy schumer for instance reposting campus reform like a conservative campus publication <laughs> we are seeing mainstream well, celebrities now posting right-wing things and actually saying wow we were wrong about the left i can't believe we were so wrong because yeah. of how many people have cheated, like BLM posting the paraglider. Yeah, yeah that's but stupid. We, we definitely got to go to Super Chat. So okay, I, but I would just say, you know, with this, we see the same tactics that the left deploys when it comes to Israel. Criticism of Israel is always called anti-Semitic. I agree. And, you know, it's they're deploying. It's annoying. Yeah. We haven't called anyone anti-Semitic. Like, no, no, but he's right. It, no, it's but that really annoying happen. when they're like, if you're criticizing yeah. Israel, you're anti-Semitic. No, 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 no. If there's a war going on and someone's doing bad things in war, criticize the f out of them i don't care who yeah. they are it's we, I, I i roast the united states all day today about the horrible things the u.s does yeah. it's just that i ain't israel if and that's another thing why if you're hanging why with I people focus. that say gas the jews you're probably should well, should go the reason somewhere. why I, and, focus and I gotta be honest if you're, if you're hanging with people who are saying glass gaza you got a problem as yes. well. yeah the reason why i focus my criticism on israel same thing with ukraine is because my government is uh enabling this funding this backing this israel probably wouldn't be able to go as hard as they are without the U.S. didn't send all these aircraft carriers to the Middle East. We're completely enabling this. And again, to the people that are being well, killed, they're being killed by Israel and the United States. And the U.S. is sending we're troops creating on the ground. Enemies. And yes. we probably already have special forces in Gaza. Dude, but let's let's sorry. let's read more super yeah, chats. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just going to. All right. David Ray says you must have J.P. Sears on your show ASAP. Uh, J.P. Sears has a standing invitation to come yeah. on any one of our shows or even just to come here and hang out and have a slice of pizza because we're big fans. He's awesome. Um, but as I always say. It's, it's, you know, like we, we tried getting Jenk Uger on the show for a long time and he, he wouldn't do it. And I'm like, well, he hosts his own show. Come on. He's not going to cancel his show to come here, but he's running for president. So he did. We're happy he did. <laughs> if uh, JP Sears ever has time 
or he's on the East Coast. We'd love to have him. But I, I'm not surprised people who host shows are too busy to come and be on my show. Typically, the people who come on the show do different, are, are not hosts, and they have day jobs where it's like, oh, I can swing by that night and do the show. But, uh, you know, we'd love to have him. We'd love to have him. All right. Let's, uh, here we go. Dalimar says forklift gate is real. Texas sued and got a temporary injunction against the U.S. government to stop messing with the wire. The forklift was part of the case. Wow. wow. Was it a forklift? I think it was a back loader, though. It wasn't a forklift, back, right? It looked like a back end loader. Yeah. Yeah, no, a forklift. It's funny because I, nobody knows what they're called. And I, I just, I Googled it like a week ago. <laughs> Because yeah. I'm like, what, 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 what do we call those things? They're not cranes. Yeah, well, back end loader. Bolded. Right, yeah. exactly. It's a yeah. backhoe. Yeah, yeah. backhoe, backhoe. A backhoe, loader. right. My yeah. kid's learning, my two-year-old like knows all the construction vehicles, like all the kid shows on YouTube. Nice. It's like all tractors and stuff. It's kind of nice. cool. Check out Open Source Ecology, build your own. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, shout out to Marcin Jakubowski. All right, let's go. Uh, Frag Null says, Timcast 2024, and yeah, my payday is your payday. woo woo uh, I want good silicon. So Taiwan silicon forges is good to protect. Talk amongst yourself. No, no, Bolton, the mustache. <laughs> uh, we have an eclectic bunch of Tim Cass. I'm very proud of that. Like, I'm I'm particularly uh, proud of the fact that Ilad and Cassandra are friends, and boy, are they on the other sides of of the political spectrum. I, I, Ilad is yeah. our resident Bolton bro, neocon. He calls himself this. That's but but he's Bolton bro. He, yeah, but he's, but when he when he interviews the protesters, he's very fair. He just ask him a question, lets him answer. He doesn't insert anything. He does a good job. And then Cassandra is as anti-war and as isolationist as you can be, and hates Israel. Yeah, as I well, hardcore, you know, yeah, <laughs> she's hardcore. I mean, it's great. I think the diversity of thought is really good to have. Yeah, the, 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 this company is not uh, made upon the ideological goals of like a military operation or or, or a, a single news event. It is simply, I mean, I got to be honest, what Cassandra and Elad represent is quite literally the ideological goal of, of one of one of the ideological goals of, of me and this company is that people are allowed to have different opinions and discuss those opinions and be mad at each other. But we all live together and we get along. So actually, they're exemplifying what I think is important in this country, that we we maintain the ability for, for dissent. It used to be a lot more common. I know. So uh, I disagree with Cassandra on a lot of things. And, uh, you know, I've talked to her about it. but. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to stop being friends with someone because of our opinions on a foreign war. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the craziest thing ever. It's funny. People yeah. were like in the tweets of people who'd be like, like, you know, don't go on Tim Cass anymore because Cassandra's opinions. And I'm like, oh, OK, dude, <laughs> like you, you, you people yeah, have been on people like tagging you in her tweets. Yeah, like, I know. I know. I love it. Funny. Like, bro, I just want to I just want to stress out. like <laughs> I've known Cassandra for a decade. She's one of my best friends. Her opinion on war in a foreign land is not going to affect our friendship and I'm not going to fire her over that. It's like one thing, one, it's a big thing. It's foreign policy and people are allowed to have opinions. Same thing with Ilad. He, we, I yelled at him. Like we got, into a, we, we, we got into a yelling match because we were, we were arguing about war and he was for war saying he wasn't for war. He's like, I don't want war, but we must win it. And I'm like, we got into it heavy on one of the members only segments. And I'm like, I apologize after I'm like, I sorry I got so heated, you know, but I'm, I'm glad we can have that, you know, that's what it's all about. All right, let's read some more. All right. Paul Thongham says, Tim, to have the people better understand China, please have people from the YouTube channel China Uncensored on. You see, I was mentioning we get these messages all the time. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll just say, uh, you know, Cassandra, let's let's have China yeah. Uncensored on. Should David saying uh, Laowa 86. Yeah. And Laowa. Also Serpent ZA. All good China sources. Oh, uh, speaking of China, uh, my friend Joseph Solis Mullen, he writes at the Libertarian Institute. He just put out a book about China called The Fake China Threat, kind of uh, yeah. trying to go against some of the war propaganda. So go check that out. Are you familiar with Thucydides' Trap? Yes. So that's that's the general, it's, I wouldn't call it the layman's understanding because it's a little bit more esoteric, but the simple idea is the minutia doesn't matter. What matters is we are facing a rising economic threat to the United States. The United States is not going to tolerate that. Yeah. And, and, you know, but we do have a choice. I mean, I prefer the uh, the, the Trumpian. But another thing about this book, sorry, uh, that uh, Solis Mullen gets into, you know, he's a libertarian. It's from kind of a more right wing perspective is about the trouble that China has economically. And one of the best arguments in the book is if you look at China's backyard, they have a big border with India, Japan. I mean, these are big uh, countries that don't want uh, a China to expand in the region. 
Um, so they have a lot to deal with in their own neighborhood. So there's a lot of reasons just not to be so afraid of China. And that's what he lays out in the book pretty well. The Lion says a culture war episode with Laowai 86 and Serpent ZA would be pretty dope. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you want to you want to you want to message Lisa and. Uh, yes, I'm going to sort it out. I don't know. That'd be sweet. I'd like to see them as well. That'd be so really cool. Watch them personally. I think, so. I think next week we might be doing a debate on Israel. Yes, Scott. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. And, uh, and, and I, I believe it's Scott and Will Chamberlain. We normally don't announce, but it's like, mm. these are friends, these are friends of the Horton? show. Where Scott Horton and Will Chamberlain, Good. they were going at it on Twitter, uh, on X. And, uh, <laughs> but it's funny because like, you know, I talk about how people have Israel derangement syndrome and I don't mean, I don't mean just against, I mean for or against it. Mm -hmm. Like it's like. It's it's hyper polarized. It's always like one mm -hmm. super extreme or the other, yeah. and uh, people are then stop talking about. It. I'm like, right now the big news and the threat in the Middle Eastern region is over Israel. We're going to talk about and it. It's just it's a conversation you don't rush, which is part of why the last the 15 minutes where you guys were talking seems so yeah, frantic like and quick, frenetic. Yeah, it, you really it's a long observant conversation. I would recommend to people. You guys know Daryl Cooper. Negative. Uh, Martyr Made podcast. Oh yeah yeah. yeah. He has like a 26 hour series. Uh, oh, it's yeah. called Fear and Fear Loathing in, in East Jerusalem. Jerusalem, or not East Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. Yeah. And it is excellent. Yeah, he's been on when I was, when I was in. Get uh, him on to talk about Israel. I when, mean, he's really good. Very when serious. I was in, uh, when I was in Tel Aviv, whenever I would walk out of my hotel, there was a like four foot tall tree stump. Like, I guess you'd call it a stump. The tree was cut down. And there was this cat just sitting on it every time, just staring at me as I walked out. And I'm like, what is this cat? This strange omen. When I was in Jordan, I stayed in Amman for a few weeks. Cat was cool. Though. There was a little red cat that stayed outside my door, and I fed like everybody that oh. stayed in the place like fed them. There's Tur cats everywhere. They love during cats. Uh, during the uh, uh, elections in Turkey. This is back in I think like 2014. I was in uh, Istanbul. We were going from uh, around different precincts because there was concern over election fraud and crazy stuff was going on. And this street dog decided to become friends with us and come with us everywhere we went. I called him Herman because Herman is the name I give to any animal at any point because it's just like a generic name. Like you're Herman now, and uh, I got a picture of him. It was really, it was so, it was so. I, I love Turkey, man. It's such a, Istanbul is so fun. But like the dog basically adopted us, and we were like, we got a dog now, mm -hmm. and he just walked with us everywhere we went. And we would leave, and he would run and walk with us. We didn't give him anything; he just hung out. It was, it was, it was yeah, pretty cool. cool. All right, here we go. JD says the horseshoe crab's blood is drawn while alive and on board the vessel that caught it. The crab is then released alive back into the ocean. The blood is studied by universities, and they pay pretty good uh, to utilize U.S. commercial lobstermen to get it. I just want to stress, imagine you and your buddies are hanging out, like, outside the bar, when a UFO appears over you and beams you up, and then you're, like, strapped <laughs> to the thing, going, like, what's happening? And they plug a thing and suck your blood out. You're like, help me! And then they drop you back down, and you're like, I swear, I swear. And they're like, shut up, that didn't happen. We're literally abducting crabs and stealing their blood. That is exactly what's <laughs> We're happening. We're abducting crabs. The crabs, like a big silver thing in, ab above us came and it pulled me in and they're like, get out of here, crab dude. You're crazy. <laughs> I wonder what would cause that because I would go down to like this little harbor that was by my house on Long Island and sometimes there would just be like, just the whole beach covered in dead horseshoe crabs. Jeez. All right, all right. David Molin uh, uh, Molinarolo says, Tim, Quote, supporting Ukraine is pro-war. Also, Tim, we should invade Canada. Brilliant. Yeah. I am joking about the Canada invasion thing. It's I'm the, not. It's the and cultural <laughs> invasion, like yeah, the yeah, British yeah, invasion yeah. of the right. Beatles and all that. I am serious about invading Alaska because it's 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 ours already. And we have a lot of resources there that we could we could stop worrying about China, rare earths and and, and yeah. these things if mm -hmm. we just go to Alaska. Yep. And uh, they won't do it. They won't do it. That's yeah, truth. And we could, developing Alaska would be fantastic. Alaskans, uh, we had a bunch of people messages saying they'd love it because it would help expand industry and, and you know, build things and boost the economy. It's good stuff. They got good stuff. Yeah, Alaska is very big. Is Alaska the biggest state? Yes. Yeah, it is, right? Yes, it is. It's like half the size of the country or something like it's, that? I think it's, it's a big. third of a the third land of the mass of the, uh, the lower 48. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy, man. Wow. Alaska is based AF. Deus Flex says, reminder that the Barbary Wars was the only reason Thomas Jefferson purchased a Quran and Ilhan Omar used it to swear herself into office. Yep. Oh, jeez. Oh. That's what I'm talking about. Know thine enemy, That's man. If you're afraid of something, investigate it. She used his Quran? Is that what it was? Yeah. Wow. A good one. Yeah. If you're going to use a Quran, that's a good one to use. But, but like, the reason it exists is not for the reason it is presumed when she puts her hand on it. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's like oh wow he had a Quran he was studying like I will swear it was more so like he was studying because they were enemies. Mm. 
Yep. He's like, yeah, the guy's like, hey, you're an infidel. My book says I can do this. And he goes, for real? Let me see that. <laughs> yeah. That's my Like, I'm going to look at this. For real? For real? No cap? <laughs> no cap. <laughs> That's exactly what Thomas Jefferson said. Oh, okay, let's grab another one. Guadluck says there's a $6,000 hollow Charizard at the card shop near me. $6,000? Wow. Yeah, there was a, there's a viral video right That's now crazy. of a guy opening a Charizard, and it's $250,000 or something. I don't know exactly. 250000 Yeah. Wow. I mean, so a Black Lotus is worth more. Yeah. Wow. Some of those new Pokemon cards are going for a lot of money, man. New ones? Yeah, well, not so, new ones, but... Here's a trick. With Magic the Gathering, when a new set comes out, there's usually some cards that are worth 50 bucks right away. Instantly. Because you'll need them for the uh, uh, the top... They're called net decks. And so uh, when you're playing competitively in the uh, standard format, where it's like... I don't, know, I don't know how they're doing it these days. Five, the last five sets or something. So... Uh, a card will come out and you know, it'll be called like Ian the Great. And it just came out. They're all over the place. But everybody who wants to build the top tier deck for competition needs it. So the demand is ridiculously high right away. Usually what ends up happening is, or I should say in certain circumstances, this, this happened at least uh, once to me. You can buy a box of boosters for 150 bucks and you're almost going to, you're going to get one or two. And so the combined value of all the all the cards you pull will be greater than the cost of the box itself. Wow. It's because the average person does not want to spend 150 bucks on a bunch of random cards. They want the one single card, mm -hmm. so they pay a premium just to get it. And that makes means you can buy a bunch of boxes, crack them all open, and turn a profit. Yeah. And card shops do that. That's what they do. My, they open boxes kid, and then put them in display. When I was a kid, my friends' parents did that. They just bought all the Pokemon cards and would sell the expensive ones and then give us the nuts, ah, the, the cheap scraps. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's uh, grab one last one. KCB says, the right wing has become tolerant and weak. We are being socially engineered to revert back to being patriotic, though, uh, through ever-increasing oppression. Recruiting is way down, and the military needs patriots. The interesting thing is, when we were talking with Stephen Marsh earlier, he mentioned, you know, in his book, The Last Election, like, that, that it always comes down to what the military decides to do. And I think that's a really interesting point. If people are resigning their commissions because of wokeness and the military is overly woke, I think it's fair to say we know what direction the military would go in the event of civil conflict. There's part of me that thinks that the reason the the upper echelon, the the brass, if you will, uh, in the military are woke is because when you get to the higher um, higher ranks, definitely generals, it becomes political. So they're I don't know that they. I don't know that I believe that they actually believe in the woke stuff so much as know that, you know, know the things that they have to say and the positions that they have to hold if they're going to achieve another, you know, another, if you're going to get another star, if you got one star and you want a second one, you want to get another, you know, another, uh, you want to get another com commission or get a command or whatever, you have to be able to, you have to say the right things and, and have the right opinions. All right, everybody, if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends, become a member at TimCast.com, click join us. We'd love to see you there. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Dave, do you want to shout anything out? Yeah, check out Antiwar.com. We are non-interventionist libertarians. I have a YouTube channel called Antiwar News with Dave DeCamp where I give you the news five days a week from a non-interventionist anti-war perspective. Go over there. Do I tell them to smash it? Yes, just smash the absolutely subscribe just, button. Just yeah. smash, smash just everybody. Smear the, yeah, crush it. Gen go, gently up caress. That channel and uh, the subscribe button. Anti war. Yeah. What's the channel called again? It's called Anti War News with Dave DeCamp, and that's me. And I work for AntiWar.com, which has been around since 1995. It was founded by Justin Romando and Eric Garris. Unfortunately, Justin passed away in 2019, but he was a genius. People should go back and read everything he wrote. Not everything, because then you don't really have time for that. But he was great. Um, yeah, and I'm really proud to work for them. Right awesome. On. I am Phil that remains of uh, Phil that remains on X. Phil that remains official on Instagram. The band is all that remains. You can follow us on Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Music, Pandora, YouTube. You know the internet. And I'm Ian Cross, and it is great to be back. Good to see you guys. Great to meet you, Dave. And uh, I want to remind you to check out Gamer Maids, the newest show on uh, Tim Pool's network, on the TimCast network. I guess it's all of our network at this point. And also check out my YouTube channel if you want to find solutions. We're about to save the world. Things are changing rapidly right now, and you can be a part of the change. Witness it. Understand the technology. We're going to build hydrogen fuel, graphene. Check out my YouTube channel. Check out the interview with James Tour, Dr. James Tour out of Rice University. Subscribe. Like the video. And I'll catch you guys next week. 
yeah, good to have you back again. Uh, it's been a good week. I uh, will be in the comments in the videos for the last week. I'm going to try and do that and see if anyone said anything that's cool and spicy and fun to argue about. My name is Serge.com. See you next week. We will see you all next week. Clips are up throughout the weekend. Thanks for hanging out.